and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Just a quick show note before we begin. A few weeks ago, I did an interview with Sean McFadden from the YouTube channel Deep Noetics. Sean is an educator who's preparing a new course on the nature of power, and we talked about power from a historical perspective. Uh, Sean is a great interviewer, and some minor audio issues notwithstanding, I felt like we had a rich conversation. You can find the link to our chat in the episode description, and I encourage you to check it out. Also, Patreon memberships are still just $1 a month. It's a great way to show support for the show, and you get access to all 25 episodes of my video series, Dan's War College. You can also help the show by leaving a review on Spotify, leaving a like or a comment on YouTube, and especially by sharing it with your friends. That's it for show notes. Let's dive in. When people talk about different civilizations, we often use broad generalizations to describe different groups of people. So you get concepts like Islamic civilization, or Christian civilization, or East Asian civilization. These concepts are oversimplifications. There are many Islamic and Christian and East Asian civilizations with widely varying characteristics. If we're talking about something specific like French civilization or Arab civilization or Japanese civilization, we should be specific. But these broader concepts remain useful because they serve as a sort of shorthand to describe civilizational clusters. Today, I want to talk about two of these civilizational clusters, the East and the West specifically the eastern and western parts of the ancient, classical, Mediterranean world. This world includes not just southern Europe and North Africa, but also the Black Sea region, which is joined to the Mediterranean by the Sea of Marmara, which is bounded in turn by two narrow straits, the Bosporus to the north and the Dardanelles to the south. The Dardanelles is what the Greeks used to call the Hellespont. And through these straits, sail ships transporting oil and grain and metal ores and slaves. The ancient Greek and Roman worlds are connected not just to each other, but also to regions as far flung as Crimea and portions of the Pontic steppe in the southern part of modern day Ukraine. Even today, we see a east-west divide in that part of the world, with the fervently eastern Russian army battling the western-backed Ukrainian army. The western powers are worried about threats from Iran, which is just what we modern people call Persia. Those same areas where different civilizational clusters are bumping heads in the 21st century were also hot spots of geopolitical friction in the ancient world. How far east does the Roman Empire expand? Until it hits steppe peoples in the northeast and in the Persian Empire in the southeast. But it didn't have to be that way. In the first century BC, the fate of the Black Sea region is very much in doubt. The Roman Republic is still digesting the Mediterranean and has only just begun extending its fingers eastward into Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey. The Romans called it Asia Minor. If an ambitious leader were to unite the various Black Sea coastal city-states while the Romans are busy down in the Mediterranean, well, that leader could form an empire of the East to rival the Roman Empire of the West. One man, Mithridates VI, the king of Pontus, nearly succeeds in doing just that. 
This is the story of Mithridates VI, also known as the Poison King, the last man to threaten Roman authority in the East for more than 300 years. Through much of what could loosely be called the Eastern world, Mithridates is something of a folk hero. If you're like me and you're a fan of the Roman Empire, this can be tough to swallow. But every story has two sides, and in this story, not everybody is on the side of Rome, especially not the people who are getting conquered by Rome. In her excellent book, The Poison King, The Life and Legend of Mithridates, Rome's Deadliest Enemy, Stanford University professor Adrian Mayer writes, quote, After the defeat of Rome's great enemy Hannibal in the Second Punic War, 202 BC, the Romans took lands in Spain, North Africa, Greece, and the Near East. This early Roman expansion was not carried out according to an imperial master plan. Instead, the Senate conferred approval on ambitious commanders seeking personal glory and riches through foreign conquests. In conquered or threatened lands, the Romans were feared as bloodthirsty, driven by lust for gold and triumph. The historian Polybius described how Roman soldiers took special pride in a vicious way of war. Their orders, he claimed, were to systematically kill every living thing before beginning to loot. In the legion's wake, said Polybius, lay smoldering battlegrounds and devastated towns, streets and fields strewn with the bodies of men, women, and children put to the sword, and even dogs, sheep, and cows chopped to pieces. End quote. This is the environment in the eastern Mediterranean and southern Black Sea regions in the late 2nd century BC. And it's here that our story begins. In the year 135 BC, a baby is born in the city of Sinope, in north-central Anatolia, which is the Asian part of modern-day Turkey, on the south coast of the Black Sea. Now, Dates in the classical era are often fuzzy. Unless you have multiple events to cross-reference, you often have to make do with large date windows for particular events. But we know the date of this baby's birth because it's heralded by a comet, and ancient sources write about this comet. The Romans write about it, as do the Han Chinese. In both the Roman and ancient Chinese cultures, comets are seen as heralds of bloodshed, and people in the far west and far east alike are worried about what the comet of 135 BC may portend. But in ancient Persia, Anatolia, and the Black Sea region, comets are seen as good omens. A few generations later, Three wise men from this area of the world will follow another comet to Judea to worship a baby who they believe to be the son of God. Now, I'm not just bringing Jesus Christ into this story to sensationalize this other baby's birth. I don't have to. The facts and the other similarities between the events speak for themselves. For example... Ancient Persian and Chinese astronomers will often speak of a celestial event hanging over a particular city to describe its location. So we end up with a star hanging over Bethlehem during the birth of Christ. And in 135 BC, there is a star hanging over the city of Sinope, capital of the Greco-Persian kingdom of Pontus. Now, on any given night, in any given city, any number of babies are being born. So, how do we know that this particular baby is the reason for the comet, if you believe in such things? Well, as it turns out, there is a special birth taking place, and this birth would already have drawn some attention, comet or no. 
As the comet of 135 BC blazes in the night sky, the queen of Sinope, Laodice VI, gives birth to a young prince, the new heir to Pontic king Mithridates V. Ancient Persian and Anatolian prophecies speak of a god-king who will be born under the sign of a star and free the East from Roman aggression. One of the most popular prophecies comes from the Zoroastrian tradition, which says that Mithra, an Iranian god of light, truth, justice, and friendship, will send his servant to free his people from a powerful empire. This is why many Eastern kings in this era, like Mithridates V, are named Mithridates, which means sent by Mithra. And sure enough, Mithridates V names his new heir Mithridates as well. And the little baby born under the sign of the comet becomes known as Mithridates VI. And if the comet alone isn't enough proof of his divine mission, there's another sign. When he's still a baby, legend says that Mithridates' crib is struck by lightning, leaving a scar on his forehead. In ancient Persian culture, anyone who survives a lightning strike is considered to be destined for some great purpose, which only plays into the expectations for this child. Not much is known about Mithridates' childhood. This comes down to a shortage of sources. Most of our ancient sources on Mithridates are Roman, and until he starts making trouble for the Romans, Mithridates is just another small prince of a small eastern state, barely worth mentioning, if at all, in the historical record. What we do know is that he grows up with a mixture of Greek and Persian influences. His father, the older Mithridates, is descended from Persian royalty, the dynasty of Darius the Great. And his mother, Laodice VI, is of Seleucid Greek descent, so she's ultimately descended from one of Alexander the Great's generals. In a way, Mithridates VI represents the unification of Greek and Persian culture and the heritage of Alexander's empire. Remember, Alexander the Great is only a couple of centuries in the past at this point. He's still a very relevant historical figure. People want to imitate him. And there are even rumors that the young Mithridates VI is descended from Alexander the Great himself, or even from the legendary Greek demigod Hercules. After all, a baby born under the sign of a star has to be special, right? Much of what we do know or think we know about Mithridates' early life comes to us indirectly. For example, no surviving records exist of the prince's education, but we know the kind of education he would have received in this time and place, given his pedigree. He would have studied both Greek and Persian literature, and he would have learned both languages from a young age. Including local dialects, Mithridates will go on to speak 22 languages as an adult. And as the heir to the throne of a small kingdom, he is also trained in war. One of the few actual records we have of his childhood is an account from the Roman historian Justin, who talks about the young Mithridates learning to ride a horse and throw a spear. Justin presents this as an attempt by his mother's agents to arrange an accidental death for the young prince. And these men put him on a horse that's way too wild for such a young boy. But of course, our hero completes his trial and comes out unscathed. Mithridates' Greek education would also have included the study of traditional botanical medicine, a study that will grow to become an obsession with poison. In her book, The Poison King, which is the only modern English language book to attempt to describe Mithridates' character, 
Adrian Mayer writes about a number of important cultural influences the young king would have grown up with. One of these is the old Carthaginian general, Hannibal Barca, who had died a little less than 50 years before Mithridates' birth. Hannibal had spent his entire career fighting against the Romans and is most famous for his crossing of the Alps. But after the fall of Carthage, the one-eyed general had gone into exile, first in the Levant and then in Anatolia all the while serving as a commander for one or the other of Rome's enemies. During his final years, Hannibal added not one but two poison-related incidents to his already impressive resume. Roman historian Cornelius Nepos writes about a naval battle where Hannibal had his men capture a bunch of venomous snakes and put them into clay pots, and they catapulted these pots full of snakes onto the Roman ships, and the Romans ran away. But eventually, the Romans threatened Hannibal's employer, a king named Prusius, into betraying him, and Hannibal soon found himself trapped in a tower, surrounded by enemy troops. Rather than accept capture and face inevitable public humiliation and execution, Hannibal drank some poison that he always carried with him for just such an occasion. So died the great Carthaginian general, and by Mithridates' time, Hannibal has become a symbol for anti-Roman resistance in the East, even to the death. This idea of death by poison isn't just a Hannibal thing. It's everywhere in the East during this time period. Anatolian royal families are constantly poisoning each other. There are even kings and queens who poison several of their own children to ensure there is only one heir to the throne. I can't have one of those succession wars going on. And this environment alone would make any prince a bit nervous about poison. But poison actually touches Mithridates personally at a young age. In either 120 or 119 BC, King Mithridates V holds a birthday party for his son. Now this party is way more lavish than anything you will see on the most ridiculous modern reality TV shows. There are acrobats, magicians, snake charmers, musicians, and storytellers to entertain the hundreds of guests. Every meal has multiple courses, and every course consists of some kind of large roasted animal like an ox or a donkey each with its own wine pairing. And the partying goes on not just for one day, but for several days. On one of these days, King Mithridates V suddenly grabs his throat, seizes up, and falls to the floor dead. He's obviously been poisoned. There's no question about that. Uh, The question is, who has poisoned him? Like I said, Anatolian court life is rife with poisonings in this time period. You could stand in the middle of young Mithridates VI's birthday party, throw a rock, and whoever you hit would probably be a viable suspect for the king's murder. But there's one person in particular who stands out, and that's none other than the queen, Laodice VI. Laodice has a motive. While Mithridates' father had favored his claim to the throne as eldest son, Laodice has always favored the couple's younger son, also named Mithridates. Because the older Mithridates' brother is still a minor, his father's death means that he and his brother will rule together, with Laodice as regent until he comes of age. Laodice also has opportunity as well as motive. See, Mithridates V had a confidant, 
a trusted younger general named Doraleus, who he assumed would help oversee the government in the event of his untimely death, and who he thought would keep the young Mithridates VI safe. But during Mithridates VI's birthday party, Doraleus is way off on the island of Crete on an army recruitment drive. And as soon as she takes power as regent, Laodice makes it known that Doraleus is no longer welcome in the kingdom of Pontus. And just like that, the 15 or 16 year old Mithridates VI is a co king with no real power and no military protection, subject to his regent mother who probably killed his father and would like nothing more than to see him dead so his younger brother can become sole king. Our young hero is clearly in danger. Before I go any further, a quick sidebar on names... If you're frustrated by all of these people named Mithridates, don't worry. So are the Greeks. To tell everybody apart, they take nicknames. So, Old King Mithridates V, the one who was just killed, is known as Mithridates V Euergetes, or Mithridates the Benefactor. Our hero, Mithridates VI, will eventually be known as Mithridates VI Eupator, meaning good father. The younger Mithridates' brother is known as Mithridates Crestus, meaning the good. So from here on out, I will call our hero Mithridates Eupator and his brother Mithridates Crestus when there's any chance of confusion. Oh, and... If that's not enough, Mithridates' younger sister is named after his mother, so there are also two Laodices in our story. The Greco-Persians don't so much have a baby name book as a single page of baby names printed in large font, and I'm sorry about that. Anyway... Mithridates Eupator realizes that it would be suicide to stay in the city of Sinope. Whether by poison or some other means, his mother has every intention of killing him. Rather than sit around and wait for Laodice's henchmen to strike first, Mithridates decides to go into hiding. Our hero gathers a few close friends and takes off into the mountains to live a rough life in the wilderness, far from anyone who might recognize him and tell Laodice of his whereabouts. The Roman historian Justin writes, quote, He pretended a fancy for hunting, and the indulgence of which he never went under a roof for seven years, either in the city or the country, but rambled through the forests, and passed his nights in various places among the mountains, none knowing where he was. He accustomed himself to escape from the wild beasts, or pursue them by speed of foot, and by this means, while he avoided the plots laid for him, he inured himself to endure all manner of bodily exertion. End quote. Mithridates is obsessed with physical fitness, and has no objection to living rough. This is appropriate for a prince from Sinope. The city's most famous philosopher, Diogenes the Cynic, had been a proponent of homelessness and had lived much of his life in a large clay wine barrel. Spending time in the wilderness also gives Mithridates valuable experience in navigating terrain and finding good places to hide, skills that will serve him well later in life. That said, no other single interest will ever eclipse our hero's obsession with poison. There are any number of poisons to choose from, starting with a variety of toxic plants that grow in the area. Pontus is home to herbs like nightshade, monkshood, mandrake, several types of poisonous mushroom, and many others. But why stop there? Pontus also offers a selection of toxic animal products, including honey produced from rhododendron nectar, and the flesh of ducks that eat the local toxic plants. Or you can just go the more traditional route and get your hands on some snake venom. 
Besides plant and animal poisons, Pontus has its share of toxic minerals, the most notorious of which is arsenic. The Greek geographer Strabo, writing in the 1st century BC, describes a Pontic mine called Mount Sandericurgium, where miners have hollowed out the entire mountain to extract red arsenic, a valuable substance used, among other things, for waterproofing ships. Strabo writes, quote, The mine used to be worked by publicans, who used as miners the slaves sold in the market because of their crimes. For in addition to the painfulness of the work, they say that the air in the mines is both deadly and hard to endure on account of the grievous odor of the ore, so that the workmen are doomed to a quick death. What is more, the mine is often left idle because of the unprofitableness of it, since the workmen are not only more than 200 in number, but are continually spent by disease and death. End quote. While nobody knows for sure, it's most likely that arsenic, like the arsenic at Mount Sandericurgium, was the poison used to kill Mithridates V Euergetes. Combine this with a social environment where poisoning is commonplace and a childhood education that included medical herbology, and Mithridates probably knows a hundred different ways to poison a man. This terrifies him, and he never eats a meal that someone else hasn't tasted first. Employing a designated taster is not all that uncommon in 1st century BC Anatolia. But Mithridates goes further and tries to develop an immunity to poison, as in an immunity to all known deadly toxins. And what he ends up doing is developing one of history's most prized and mysterious substances, Mithridate, which is named after him. Nobody knows exactly what's in Mithridate, but it's supposed to be a cure-all that, taken once a day, fortifies a person against poisoning. There's a whole rabbit hole we could go down, speculating on various ingredients in Mithridates' cure. Many people have gone down this rabbit hole, and there are several surviving recipes, although none of them are the same, which only deepens the mystery. Some of the ingredients in Mithridate are probably local poisons in small quantities that are low enough to allow the user to build up an immunity. However, this method is only effective against toxins that trigger an immune response. Right? The small dose of poison works similarly to an, a vaccine training the immune system to neutralize the toxin. But heavy metals like arsenic, for example, are non-organic, so the immune system can't counteract the poison the same way it can with an organic toxin. You can't develop an immunity to arsenic. Either you take enough to kill yourself or you survive. So taking a tiny bit of arsenic every day would only make you more susceptible to arsenic poisoning since that tiny daily dose would combine with the dose you were poisoned with to create an even larger, more dangerous dose. All of this to say that we have no idea what kind of concoction Mithridates is taking every day, but it seems to work for him. One of the most well-known literary pieces about Mithridates isn't a historical piece. It's a nonsense poem written in 1896 by British poet A.E. Houseman, who says in the final verse, quote, there was a king reigned in the east. There, when kings will sit to feast, they get their fill before they think with poisoned meat and poisoned drink. He gathered all that springs to birth from the many venomed earth. First a little, thence to more, he sampled all her killing store. And easy, smiling, seasoned sound, sate the king when healths went round. They put arsenic in his meat, and stared aghast to watch him eat. They poured strychnine in his cup, and shook to see him drink it up. They shook, they stared as white's their shirt, 
Them it was their poison hurt. I tell the tale that I heard told. Mithridates, he died old. End quote. Houseman's poem is fiction, but it's less strange than reality. Not only does Mithridates supposedly develop an effective remedy for poison, but he makes a provision to end his own life by poison. This might sound odd, but keep in mind the violent types of deaths our hero may be subjected to. Mithridates may find himself on the wrong end of a sword or even face the prospect of death by some kind of torture. If he's about to fall into the hands of his enemies, better to end it all on his terms. So he makes himself a poisoned pill and places this pill in an amulet he wears around his neck. And all throughout his life, Mithridates will carry with him the means of his own destruction. Now, if it seems like I've just gone on a long tangent without getting into many specifics of Mithridates' exile as a young man, you're not wrong. Unfortunately, those few lines I quoted from the Roman historian Justin about him sleeping rough and learning to hunt and getting exercise, well, those are the only ancient source we have on the subject of Mithridates' childhood. Justin tells us that Mithridates spends seven years in the wilderness, but this is probably a literary device on his part. Ancient writers will often use the term seven years to describe a long time. Right? Mithridates was in the wilderness for a long time, seven years. If we take Justin literally, then our hero comes back to take his throne in 113 BC. However, more modern historians go with the dates of 116 or 115 BC because we have Pontic coins issued in those years with Mithridates' comet on them, as well as some statues dedicated in his honor. Then again, Adrian Mayer argues that the statues and coins could simply be propaganda by his mother Laodice, a way of reassuring the people that she hasn't overstepped her power as regent. Don't worry, the king's not missing, he's still in power. Look, we issued some coins and put up some statues. So the whole picture of when Mithridates returns from his exile is very muddled, and the best we can say is that it happens sometime between 116 and 113 BC. We also don't know much about the nature of Mithridates' return to Sinope and seizure of power. Is there a palace coup, a popular uprising? Is there a grand battle of Mithridates' supporters versus supporters of Laodice? My best guess would be a palace coup, since if there were a major battle, presumably historians would have written about it instead of just saying, Mithridates came back to Sinope and took his throne. But there's a little more evidence for a palace coup, and that is the fact that Laodice has been regent of Pontus on paper for a few years now, but she doesn't seem to have had the backing of the entire country. Instead, she seems to have only controlled the area in and around the city of Sinope, and she seems to have mostly been interested in living a life of luxury. For example, Laodice has given away territory to the Romans rather than fight to protect it. And his Roman armies have roved around Anatolia, plundering and enslaving people. Laodice has accepted Roman loans for the construction of a new royal capital. With this money, she's built a luxurious palace compound called Laodicea conveniently located not far from Sinope, on the shore of a lake with natural hot springs. Unfortunately, as plush as Laodicea is, it is in an indefensible location. Laodicea has violated the old maxim that in times of peace, leaders should prepare for war. 
Instead, she seems to have envisioned a life of idle luxury for herself and her young son Mithridates Crestus. And if the price of that is becoming a Roman house pet, well, that's not a problem. But outside the immediate vicinity of Sinope, Laodice giving away land to the Romans and weakening Pontus's defenses and taking out loans from the Romans, these policies cannot possibly be popular with the military and social elites. So it's easy to see how Mithridates could win support inside the royal palace. No matter how he returns to Sinope, Mithridates Eupator does return and takes his rightful place as king. How he deals with his mother Laodice and brother Mithridates Crestus is as open to interpretation as everything else during this period. Most of the ancient sources simply say that Laodice and the younger Mithridates are imprisoned and die during their confinement. Others, like Appian and Memnon of Heraclea, accuse Mithridates of being far less merciful. Memnon writes, quote, Mithridates was a persistent murderer since his childhood. He had become king at the age of 13 years, and soon afterwards he imprisoned his mother, whom his father had left as joint ruler with him, and eventually put an end to her by violence. He also killed his brother. End quote. Whether or not Mithridates kills his mother and brother, there's one thing he absolutely does do that would be shocking to most people from most modern societies. He marries his younger sister Laodice, who by now is 16 or 17 years old. Sibling marriage is not unique in Pontic society. It's a staple of ruling families in the Greco-Persian world in the centuries after Alexander the Great. The Ptolemaic Egyptian royal dynasty, for example, is nothing more than a series of sibling marriages. These societies put a ton of emphasis on bloodlines, meaning there's something special about the king's royal blood. If the king were to marry someone without royal blood, the bloodline would become diluted, and what better way to be sure of your wife's royal blood than to marry your own sister? So Mithridates and Laodice get married and begin producing a series of royal children, including an heir named, you guessed it, Mithridates. In all, Mithridates and Laodice's marriage produces three sons and a daughter, and he seems to genuinely care about his sister wife. On the other hand, Mithridates has dozens of lovers and courtesans throughout his lifetime, and dozens of additional children, of whom 23 have had their names recorded in history. According to the ancient sources, all of these children are physically fit and attractive, with the exception of Mithridates' favorite daughter, the one by Laodice whose name is Dripatina. Dripatina never loses her baby teeth, and she grows up to have this horrifying double row of teeth in her face. It's not as if the royal house of Pontus is somehow immune to the negative effects of inbreeding. When he takes Laodice as his queen, you might expect Mithridates to then play the old-school monarch and marry his other sisters off to secure political alliances. But such is his obsession with maintaining a pure royal bloodline that, other than some older sisters who have already been married off, he refuses to allow any of his sisters to be married to anyone but himself. For one thing, the world is full of dangers, and if something were to happen to Laodice, Mithridates might need to remarry, so it makes sense to keep some backup queens around. For another thing, any son born to the other sisters may one day decide to claim the throne for himself. 
So Mithridates locks his younger sisters Nyssa, Roxana, and Statira away in a tower, where they will remain for the rest of his reign. Over the first few years of his reign, Mithridates gets to know his geopolitical neighbors. Since the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC, Anatolia has been dominated by a blended Greco-Persian culture, with the Persian influence stronger in the mountainous east and the Greek influence stronger along the Mediterranean coast, where many old Greek colonies continue to thrive as city-states. Alexander's empire itself had fallen apart almost immediately after his death. But while the successor states had been politically independent, they had all shared this similar culture. Then, in 133 BC, 190 years after Alexander's death and two years after Mithridates' birth, King Attalus III of Pergamon had died. Now, I can hear everybody thinking, King who? Of where? So, let's do a little geography. And if you would like a visual guide, there is a link to a map in the episode description, and the map is mostly accurate to the time of Mithridates' reign. At the time of Mithridates' birth, there are four major kingdoms on the Anatolian peninsula. In the northwest is Bithynia which controls the southwestern part of the Black Sea coast as far west as a little semi-independent Greek city-state called Byzantium. With its fertile valleys full of fruit trees, Bithynia is a major exporter of food and dyes, as well as enjoying easy access to trade. Pontus controls the eastern part of the southern Black Sea coast, and is ruled from the capital of Sinope, where Mithridates rules. Roughly to the south of Pontus, occupying roughly the southeastern part of Anatolia, is the kingdom of Cappadocia, which had been a part of the Persian Empire once upon a time before Alexander had conquered it. Unlike the other major Anatolian kingdoms, Cappadocia doesn't have a long coastline, instead relying on inland trade for its survival. The fourth major kingdom of Anatolia, Pergamon, is in the southwest. This is the most strongly Greek of the major Anatolian kingdoms and shares the Mediterranean coastline with a number of old Greek city-states. I should say that Pergamon was in southwestern Anatolia when Mithridates was born in 135 BC. But in 133, King Attalus III had died unexpectedly. Attalus, who had been either a madman or a genius, depending on who you ask, had been obsessed with botany and toxicology, much like Mithridates. And when he died without an heir, he had not given his kingdom to one of the local Greek or even Persian-descended rulers. Instead, he had willed the kingdom of Pergamon to the Roman Republic. Nobody's sure why Attalus did this. Some say he did it despite his rivals. Some historians simply call him the Mad King. Regardless, Attalus had willed his kingdom to the Romans, who come to call it the province of Asia. But Attalus did not will any of the local Greek city-states over to the Romans. How could he? He didn't have the authority to do that. But the Romans saw things differently, and when they came in with their armies to claim their new territory, they started imposing taxes everywhere they went and claiming all kinds of tribute. And if you couldn't provide money to the Romans, that was just fine. They would take payment in slaves. And if you didn't have any slaves to hand over, that was tough luck for you because now you were liable to find yourself as a Roman slave. Some of the city-states tried to resist, and they were put down. 
So did one of King Attalus' cousins, a guy named Aristonicus, and his rebellion was put down, and that's how you ended up where we started at the beginning of the episode with Roman armies roving across Anatolia. Before we move on from this little geography lesson, I should also mention two other important players in this part of the world. To the south, stretching from the southeast Anatolian coast down through Syria and the Levant as far as Judea, is the Seleucid Kingdom. This is the rump state of the old Seleucid Empire which had been around since the death of Alexander the Great. But while it had once been a great empire, ruled from the ancient city of Babylon, it's now what we modern people would call a failed state torn by constant civil war, and generally a place most people want to avoid. Then, to the east of Anatolia, in the Armenian highlands and Caucasus mountains, lies the kingdom of Armenia, which will become important later in our story, but just remember it's there because it's not important now. Right, so the Romans have taken over the old kingdom of Pergamon in southwestern Anatolia. They've made it a province of Rome called the province of Asia, and now the Romans have used threats to convince Mithridates' mother to give up some of Pontus's own territory near central Anatolia. And there seems to be nobody around to stand up to these guys. No problem. Mithridates will simply stand up to the Romans himself. And the first step to challenging Rome is to build the kingdom of Pontus into a power capable of contending with the Romans. This will be no easy task. In his book, Mithridates the Great, Rome's Indomitable Enemy, British author Philip Matizak writes, quote, Yet the question remained. If Pontus was going to build itself an empire, where was the new territory going to come from? The Romans, whilst helping themselves to the spoils of Asia, as they termed their new acquisition of Pergamum, kept a jealous eye on the balance of power among their new neighbors. From the Roman point of view, the westernmost borders of overpowerful Pontus had been trimmed back, and the kingdom had borne the humiliation with commendable fortitude. A major war in the West was only going to happen over strong Roman objections, and with Rome itself taking sides against the aggressor. Perhaps a coalition of all the powers in Asia Minor might have been able to deprive Rome of its possessions in the region, but for a herd of country bumpkins, the Romans were proving annoyingly good at diplomacy. Anyone attempting to take on Rome would almost certainly suffer the fate of Aristonicus, with the other powers of Asia Minor piling in on the Roman side for whatever rewards they could get. Mithridates was probably sophisticated enough to recognize tactics of divide and conquer when he saw them in operation, but he was neither military strong enough in his own kingdom nor diplomatically trusted enough among his neighbors to be able to do anything about it. The only alternative was to take advantage of the Roman obsession with the status quo. If Rome would not permit Pontus's rivals to attack him from the west, Mithridates could rely on the Pax Romana to secure that flank of the kingdom, while the military power of Pontus was deployed elsewhere. South was Cappadocia, satisfactorily cowed at present, and anyway, another area where Rome frowned on explicit interference. East was Armenia. Mithridates and his advisors probably contemplated this rich and growing kingdom with predatory interest. But Armenia was hard to invade and easy to defend, closely linked with Parthia, and currently a useful buffer between Pontus and the expansionist Parthian Empire. However, if Armenia was a sleeping dog best left to lie, there was still Armenia Minor. For generations, Armenia Minor had been subject to Pontus without really being a part of it. 
It lay snuggled between northeast Cappadocia, Armenia proper, and southeast Pontus. Not only was it a rich area with an excellent supply of cavalry, but it offered access to the lands on the eastern shores of the Black Sea, especially the legendary lands of Colchis, north of Armenia. And it had probably occurred to Mithridates that if Pontus did not get established in Colchis, then the Armenians would probably get around to doing so either by themselves or at the prompting of their Parthian Suzerians. In consequence, probably sometime around 115 BC, Mithridates sent a large army to the borders of Armenia Minor and politely asked Antipater, the current ruler, to hand over the kingdom. Antipater wisely did so without fighting. In later years, Armenia Minor was to become a Mithridated redoubt, a fortress-studded corner of the kingdom to which Mithridates fell back when life became too perilous in the west. Probably with the same expedition and the same army with which he annexed Armenia Minor, Mithridates next descended on the port of Trapezus, of which Pontus had long been Caesarian and protector. It was suggested that the citizens of Trapezus could be better protected, for example, from large armies camped nearby, if they were fully enrolled citizens of Pontus, and unsurprisingly the citizens agreed. End quote. So, within a few years of taking power, Mithridates has grown his little kingdom into a big kingdom that envelops the eastern half of the Black Sea. At this point, the chronology gets a little bit confused because our sources are very scarce. But basically, there are some Greek city-states in Crimea on the northern Black Sea coast, and these city-states are constantly under attack by barbarians. And when Mithridates starts to look like the most powerful guy in the eastern Black Sea neighborhood, the Crimean city-states ask him to help them fight the barbarians. So Mithridates sends one of his generals along with an army to help them. The general arrives. The local Greek kings literally hand over power to Mithridates, and not only are the allied Greek and Pontic armies able to put down the barbarians, but some of the barbarians actually decide to join up and become part of the kingdom of Pontus. And by the way, these people called Scythians, these people who our sources also call barbarians, are far from uncivilized. Uh, the Scythians who live in the steppe land of modern-day Ukraine are skilled blacksmiths and horse breeders, and their cavalry will form a key part of Mithridates' army for years to come. Mithridates isn't building an empire like the Roman one, where everything gets standardized and people from all over are expected to become legionaries and fight the same way and act the same way. In Mithridates' empire, people from different cultures will fight in the style they're accustomed to. Whether that's on foot in a traditional Greek phalanx or on horseback with a bow and spear. As he builds his base of power around the eastern Black Sea, Mithridates also builds up his treasury. Pontus itself is already a wealthy kingdom, with massive tuna and mackerel stocks that produce huge quantities of salted fish for export. The country has deposits of salt, iron, copper, gold, silver, mercury, and other minerals. The Black Sea coast is dominated by rich, fertile land covered in wheat fields, olive groves, and fig orchards, with a smattering of peaches and nuts for good measure. Pontus's natural resources alone still can't explain the amount of wealth Mithridates amasses over just a few years. Trade with the newly acquired Crimean city-states provides access to new sources of inland trade. 
Combine that with already existing trade from Persia, India, and even China, and there are a whole lot of goods and gold flowing through Pontic territory, all of which is taxable. There's also another source for Mithridates' wealth, at least allegedly. Adrian Mayer makes a compelling argument that our hero is earning a small fortune from piracy. She writes, quote, Pontus was rich. Its navy controlled the Black Sea trade. For as long as anyone could remember, swift pirate ships had plied the same waters. Large pirate fleets amassed wealth by supplying the sprawling Roman slave market on the island of Delos, unloading thousands of fresh captives every day. During Mithridates' childhood, he heard a lot of talk of piracy and certainly met pirate captains in his father's banquet halls. Pirates were raiding ship and shore with increasing boldness, even kidnapping Roman nobles for ransom. More than a thousand pirate vessels cruised the Black Sea and Aegean during the first century BC. They considered themselves a sovereign nation of the high seas. Pontus had long benefited from lucrative arrangements with the pirates, ensuring safe harbors and markets where they could sell booty. His father's military advisor, the elder Dorilaus, recruited mercenaries and pirates in the Aegean and the Black Sea for Pontus. During his own wars on Rome, Mithridates would count the great pirate navies among his strongest allies. Mithridates' access to money throughout his life has posed a perennial puzzle for historians. Pirate plunder was surely one source. End quote. By around 110 BC, or six years into his reign, give or take, Mithridates has built a small empire. He's grown his country's economy by leaps and bounds, socked away a large fortune in gold caches throughout his territory, and secured his succession by fathering not one, but three legitimate sons. That's a productive few years for any ruler. But if he's going to challenge Rome, our hero is going to have to grow even larger. Unsure of how to proceed, Mithridates knows he needs more information. So he decides to personally travel into neighboring lands and do a little scouting. Since this would be tough to do as a king with a big flamboyant retinue, he instead goes in disguise, traveling with a few of his old companions and living anonymously on the road. He actually disappears in the middle of the night without warning anyone, not even Laodice. Imagine one day that Joe Biden just disappears out of the White House bedroom and people question the Secret Service agent who is guarding the door and he says, well, the president left with some friends and they're going on a secret mission and he said not to follow him and then the president is just gone for months on end. How long do you think it takes before they swear in Kamala Harris? Well, that's the kind of situation Laodice is dealing with at some point between 110 and 108 BC. Mithridates is gone for almost a year. At first, Laodice and the royal advisors pretend that nothing is wrong, but as time goes on, more and more people start to notice that no one has actually seen the king of Pontus in a long time. There's always some excuse for why he can't take visitors. Or maybe he's off in another city, supposedly, but it turns out no one there has seen him either. Our historical sources for this period don't tell us much at all about what Laodice is up to, but we can imagine that in this environment there are plenty of powerful men jockeying for advantage, and that there's all kinds of political infighting and backstabbing. Remember, this is a world where a sitting queen can poison her own children and nobody will bat an eye. 
There is no telling what kind of pressure Laodice is under in this Game of Thrones type environment, but between the time Mithridates leaves Sinope and the time he gets back, she gives birth to a baby boy. And Mithridates is not the father. The Roman historian Justin tells us that Mithridates returns to Sinope and someone, uh, maybe not putting the dots together as far as how all the dates line up, someone just casually congratulates him on the birth of his new son. Mithridates knows how long he's been gone and that the boy can't possibly be his, but he plays it cool and he probably does a little investigating because Justin says that a female servant warns him that Laodice is planning to poison him. And then somehow, we don't know how, Mithridates kills Laodice and her co-conspirators first. Does he arrest them and have them publicly executed? Does he keep acting casual and hold a big banquet and poison them all when they're expecting him to be poisoned? All Justin tells us is that Mithridates, quote, avenged the plot upon the heads of its contrivers, end quote. That's it. No details, no drama, no theatrical flair like I would have given it to you if I had the choice, but all we have are the bare facts, and then on to the next paragraph. Laodice is dead, but that's just fine with our hero. He has three legitimate male sons to secure his dynasty, and a palace full of royal courtesans to fulfill his every lurid fantasy. It will be some time before Mithridates marries again. We'll get to his other wives as they appear, along with the one great love of our hero's life, who he won't be meeting yet for several years. During his absence, Mithridates had scouted the surrounding countries in ways that only an anonymous traveler could. For example, he has walked right up to various border defenses in Bithynia and inspected them. Our sources don't tell us much about what he did or how many places he visited, but after dealing with Laodice, he immediately starts building a massive army. As a proper Greco-Persian king does, Mithridates designs his army as a fusion between Greek and Persian styles of fighting. The core of the infantry will consist of massive pike phalanxes arranged in the traditional Greek style. The heavily armored men stand 16 ranks deep, presenting a bristling forest of spearheads to the enemy mounted on shafts that can be as long as 21 feet. The infantry are led by a close friend of Mithridates named Dorylaus, who, as you may have guessed, is the son of the general Dorylaus who had served Mithridates' father. And Dorylaus had been friends with Mithridates his entire life. He had been with him on the run as a teenager and again on his little scouting mission of the previous year. So Dorylaus is very much in the inner circle of trust and is the perfect guy to lead the infantry. Now, traditional Greek phalanxes are nigh invincible when they're attacked from the front but they're vulnerable from the sides, and their closely packed, closely ordered formation makes them difficult to maneuver to face threats from a new direction. To protect the infantry, Mithridates recruits an equally numerous body of cavalry, which comes in three varieties. The first type of cavalry are his Scythian horsemen, light raiders who were used to harass the enemy's flanks, scout his movements, and to pursue defeated foes. For open battle, Mithridates will use cataphracts, 
heavily armored cavalrymen who were the ancient forerunners of medieval knights. To these cataphracts, he adds an old Persian creation known as the scythed chariot. These are massive war machines, pulled by four horses with fearsome three-foot blades protruding from the axle of each wheel, and oftentimes with a pair of warriors to either side of the driver, armed with bows or spears. Command of the cavalry will eventually be given to Mithridates' son Arcathius, although at this point Arcathius is still too young to command. Uh, that will come later. The idea is to use the infantry, these large pike phalanxes, along with the more mobile cavalry to execute a classic hammer and anvil maneuver. The heavy infantry will march out to engage the enemy, forcing them into a fight and pinning them in place. When the enemy is fully engaged, the cavalry will sweep around the wings to attack them from the sides. And while unfortunately we don't have any good descriptions of how this looked in practice, the ancient Greek historian Xenophon does give us some detailed descriptions of scythed chariots when they were used by the ancient Persians many years prior to our story. By themselves, scythed chariots were relatively easy for disciplined troops to deal with. The chariots weren't very maneuverable, so troops could simply step aside, make a path for the chariot to pass harmlessly through their ranks, and then reform. However, scythed chariots could be devastating when used in combination with mounted cavalry as Mithridates intends to do. The chariots create holes in the enemy ranks, which the cavalry can then exploit before the enemy has a chance to reform. So, if you get the timing right, you can often win a battle with a single charge, which is what the ancient Persians did all the time. Besides his main army... Mithridates' force is augmented by a number of local irregular troops from throughout his empire. These troops are often unsuited for open battle, but can potentially be used as occupation forces, scouts, or in other specialized roles. And of course, no ancient Greek or Persian army would be complete without a large contingent of mercenaries, and Mithridates has a ton of them, commanded by a famous mercenary general named Archelaus. In fact, Archelaus is so well-respected that he doesn't just command the mercenaries, he is actually the commander-in-chief of all the Pontic land forces. The Pontic navy, meanwhile, is commanded by Archelaus's brother, a guy named Neoptolemus. Within a few years, Mithridates has built his grand army. As for his target... He has chosen the weaker mini-kingdoms of Paphlagonia and Galatia, which act as a sort of buffer zone between Pontus and Bithynia to the west. In 108 BC, in coordination with the Bithynian king Nicomedes III, he invades Paphlagonia and Galatia, and the conquests are split between Bithynia and Pontus, with Nicomedes keeping most of Paphlagonia on the Black Sea coast, and Mithridates keeping most of Galatia, which is more towards central Anatolia. At this point, the Romans try to maintain the balance of power. They send delegations ordering both Nicomedes and Mithridates to return the conquered territory to its rightful rulers or else. And both kings ignore the Romans. In this case, the or else from the Roman ambassadors turns out to be a bluff. See, the Roman Republic is currently fighting a war in the West, in the Southwest specifically, with a Numidian king named Jugurtha. Uh, 
and Jugurtha is giving them a lesson in guerrilla warfare that the Romans will remember for a long time. At one point, Jugurtha had driven the Romans out of North Africa entirely. And in 107 BC, a guy named Gaius Marius gets elected consul and takes over the bulk of the legions and goes to North Africa to take down Jugurtha for good. At the same time, an alliance of Germanic barbarians is preparing to invade Rome from the north, and everybody knows about this impending invasion, so any new legions that the Romans raise in the meantime are marching north to deal with that menace. The Republic doesn't have enough resources to fight three wars on three different fronts, so the Romans do nothing about Mithridates and Nicomedes' joint conquest of their smaller neighbors. Mithridates needs no further encouragement. He knows that this is his golden opportunity. With the Romans temporarily sidelined by their problems in North Africa and Germany, he sets his sight on the comparatively weak kingdom of Cappadocia, the slightly more Persian-flavored Anatolian state to Pontus's south. Mithridates gets help from one of his sisters, who is also named Laodice. This sister had never gone into the tower with the Virgin Sisters. She is married to the king of Cappadocia, and at Mithridates' request, she murders her husband, probably by poison, and her son, Mithridates' nephew, Ariarathes VII, becomes the new king of Cappadocia and rules as a puppet of Mithridates. Actually, this had all happened a few years back when Mithridates was out doing his incognito scouting mission, but I'm talking about it now because it's less confusing that way. Anyway, Nicomedes III, the king of Bithynia who had helped Mithridates invade Paphlagonia and Galatia like five minutes ago, marries the widow queen Laodice, and all of a sudden Cappadocia becomes a Bithynian puppet state. As it turns out, Ariarathes is sick of taking Mithridates' orders and decides to switch sides. So Nicomedes sends Ariarathes a bunch of money to build an army. And other neighboring kingdoms also send money to help the Cappadocians. And Mithridates calls up his army to regain control of his puppet kingdom. And just like that, there's a war on between Pontus and Cappadocia. The Roman historian Justin tells us that Mithridates invades Cappadocia with an army of 100,000 men, and that Ariarathes' defensive army has similar numbers. So, rather than risk a full-on battle where he might lose, Mithridates turns to literal backstabbing. He sends out a messenger to his nephew and tells him that he's impressed with his army and he'd like to talk things out. Ariarathes agrees to negotiate, and on the appointed day, both men come to a neutral encampment that's been set aside for the meeting, and each man lets the other man's guards pat him down for weapons on the way in. This is all pretty much standard protocol for the time and place. And as Mithridates is being searched and the guard is patting down his inner thigh, he tells the man to be careful because he might find the wrong kind of weapon. The guard backs off, Mithridates goes into the camp, and while the various diplomats are negotiating, he asks Ariarathes to step aside for a little private conversation. He has something to say that needs to be strictly mano a mano. And when his nephew is away from his friends, Mithridates pulls out the dagger he's concealed in his groin and stabs Ariarathes to death within sight of both armies. Then things get a bit confusing. Mithridates appoints his eight-year-old son, 
who he renames Ariarathes, to rule Cappadocia. Then he withdraws his army from the country. But the Cappadocians revolt with the support of Nicomedes, and they appoint the former king, Ariarathes VII's younger brother, also named Ariarathes, as their new king. So Mithridates has to go in again with his army and overthrow that Ariarathes, after which he appoints yet another of Ariarathes' younger brothers as the new king, and this guy is also named Ariarathes. Nicomedes appeals to the Romans to resolve the dispute of which Ariarthes' brother should be king. And Mithridates sends his own delegation to argue his side. The Romans rule that neither Ariarthes will get to be king, and that Cappadocia is going to be independent, not a puppet state of either Bithynia or Pontus, and that furthermore, Nicomedes and Mithridates will also have to give back the territory they had conquered in Paphlagonia and Galatia. Both sides agree. Nicomedes, because his kingdom is falling into debt and slowly becoming a Roman client state, and Mithridates, because by now it's around 94 BC and the Romans have long since beaten back both the Germans and the Numidians, and they can likely win a war against Pontus if they need to. The local Roman governor, an up-and-coming politician named Lucius Cornelius Sulla, appoints a new king of Cappadocia, a guy named Ario Barzanes, who will rule the country as a Roman puppet. Funny how these things work out. Gaius Marius, the Roman consul who had defeated Jugurtha in North Africa and by now has served an unprecedented six consulships, is living in Anatolia in semi-retirement. At some point during all of these negotiations with the Romans, Gaius Marius has a conversation with Mithridates, not as a Roman functionary, but just from one great man to another, and he advises him, either seek to be stronger than Rome or do her bidding. Mithridates will seek to be stronger once again taking advantage of a random stroke of luck. See, while all this stuff is going on, probably in 94 BC, Mithridates' sometime ally, sometime enemy, Nicomedes III, king of Bithynia, dies and leaves the throne to his son, whose name is also Nicomedes, because why wouldn't it be? And this new Nicomedes, Nicomedes IV, finds his kingdom in a deplorable condition. Like I said a minute ago, Bithynia is basically a Roman client at this point, and having a Roman client state on his doorstep is unacceptable to Mithridates. Not only is it what we today would call a national security threat, but Bithynia's location is a required part of his planned Black Sea Empire. If another power, Rome for instance, controls Bithynia, it doesn't matter if Mithridates controls the rest of the Black Sea coast. That other power can use its position in Bithynia to blockade Pontic merchant traffic and cut off access to the Mediterranean. Mithridates is willing to give ground over the Ifchu of Cappadocia, because Cappadocia is not central to his plans. But for Bithynia, he's willing to prod the Roman wolf, even at the risk of war. With the older Nicomedes' death, Mithridates has an opportunity to set up a client kingdom of his own in Bithynia, so he supports another candidate for the throne, a guy named Socrates the Good, who is Nicomedes IV's brother. Mithridates hastily arranges a marriage between one of his daughters and Socrates the Good, and as a wedding present, he gives his new son-in-law an army to enforce his claim to the Bithynian throne. 
Within a few years, Socrates the Good's army has won a series of victories over Nicomedes IV's army, and Socrates controls all of Bithynia except for the capital city of Nicomedia, where Nicomedes IV readies himself for a long siege and sends a message to the Romans calling for help. That's part of the deal when you're a Roman client king. You do what Rome tells you. You send them a little tribute every year, and in return, Rome will defend you from your enemies. Well, now Bithynia needs defending, and it's time for Rome to make good on their side of the deal. Unfortunately for Nicomedes IV, the Romans are now involved in a civil war called the Social War, and they're fighting against a bunch of their own Italian allied city-states, because the people of those city-states are demanding full citizenship and the people of Rome don't want to give it to them. Rome has no legions to spare, but the Romans do send a guy named Manius Aquilius. Aquilius is a formidable politician. He's a former consul, he's also a former general, and while the Romans don't have any legions to send with him, they do send him with a lot of money. And with this money, Manius Aquilius hires a bunch of mercenaries and forces Socrates the Good out of Bithynia. And once again, Nicomedes IV is ruling Bithynia as a Roman client. But Manius Aquilius isn't done with Nicomedes. See, he tells him that, yes, Rome is supposed to help defend Bithynia, but those mercenaries he hired weren't cheap, and that he's adding the cost of the mercenaries to the money Bithynia already owes Rome for all the loans it's taken out. With all this debt and the associated interest, there's no way Nicomedes IV will ever be able to pay the Romans back. Bithynia will just go into an endless debt spiral. And Manius Aquilius points out that Nicomedes is a king with an army, and that right next door is Pontus, which is a wealthy country just ripe for raiding. So in 89 BC... Nicomedes IV leads his army across the frontier and into Pontus. The Bithynian army faces no resistance and finds more than enough loot to suit its needs. But Nicomedes is starting to get nervous. Not only is Mithridates not showing up with his army, but the local population also seems to have vanished. It's almost as if Mithridates has pulled back all his people and is drawing Nicomedes into a trap. The trap in this case is not just a military trap where the Bithynian army is drawn deep into enemy territory. It's also a propaganda coup against the Romans. Because, let's be real, this is a proxy war by the Romans against Pontus, and Mithridates is making it absolutely clear that Rome is the aggressor. Many of those little Greek city-states on the Anatolian coast and the Mediterranean islands are on the fence. Do they support Rome or do they support Pontus? These are commerce-minded city-states full of merchants, and any kind of destabilizing force, like rampaging Roman client kings, is a problem for business. By comparison, Mithridates looks like a better choice to ensure regional stability. Anyway, Mithridates withdraws his population from the western part of Pontus and leaves just enough loot behind to draw the Bithynians further into the interior. Meanwhile, he sends a diplomatic mission to Rome to issue a formal protest. Since the war in Cappadocia, Rome and Pontus are not just officially at peace, but they're technically official allies. 
The Alliance only exists on paper, but Mithridates uses it as an excuse to buy time. Rather than take the dangerous step of declaring war on Rome, he can send some guys to Rome and say, Hey, we're allies. Why is your client king attacking us? The Romans hem and haw and stonewall, and both sides know the diplomatic back and forth is only for show. But it does buy time for Mithridates not to have to fight the Romans. And during this time, he also calls on his allies to help. One of those allies I haven't talked about yet, but... He's from a place I've talked about, and he's an important character going forward, and that is King Tigranes of Armenia. Tigranes has just married another one of Mithridates' daughters, a girl named Cleopatra. This is not the Cleopatra, but the marriage has cemented an alliance between Armenia and Pontus, and Mithridates and Tigranes make a deal. Tigranes invades Cappadocia with his army. Right, that kingdom in southeast Anatolia that the Romans had just forced uh, both Mithridates and Nicomedes to back off from. Well, now the king of Armenia, Tigranes, is taking it. Uh, he kicks out the Roman governor and the underprepared army, and his men take as much loot as they can carry back to Armenia. Tigranes keeps all the loot, but rulership of Cappadocia goes to Mithridates' teenaged son and cavalry commander, whose name is Arcathius. We mentioned him earlier. This completely blindsides the Romans, since they were expecting the Pontic army to attack Bithynia, and instead the Armenian army has attacked Cappadocia. At this point, Mithridates sends another diplomat, this time to the Roman generals in Anatolia. And the guy gives a great speech, basically taking credit for what happened in Cappadocia and demanding that the Romans put their buddy Nicomedes IV on a leash. Quoting from the Greek historian Appian, the diplomat says to the Romans, quote, how patiently King Mithridates bore injury from you when he was deprived of Phrygia and Cappadocia not long ago, you have been told already, O Romans. What injuries Nicomedes inflicted upon him you have seen, and have not heeded. And when we appealed to your friendship and alliance, you answered as though we were not the accusers, but the accused, saying that it would not be for your interest that harm should come to Nicomedes as though he were the injured one. You, therefore, are accountable to the Roman Republic for what has taken place in Cappadocia. Mithridates has done what he has done because you disdained us and mocked us in your answers. He intends to send an embassy to your Senate to complain against you. He summons you to defend yourselves there in person, in order that you may do nothing in haste, nor begin a war of such magnitude without the decree of Rome itself. You should bear in mind that Mithridates is ruling his ancestral domain, which is 350 kilometers long, and that he has acquired many neighboring nations, the Colchians, a very warlike people, the Greeks bordering on the Euxene, and the barbarian tribes beyond them. He has allies also ready to obey his every command, Scythians, Taurians, Bestarnae, Thracians, Sarmatians, and all those who dwell in the regions of the Don and Danube in the Sea of Azov. Tigranes of Armenia is his son-in-law, and the Arisid king of Parthia is his ally. He has a large number of ships, some in readiness and others building, and apparatus of all kinds in abundance. The Bithynians were not wrong in what they told you lately about the kings of Egypt and Syria. Not only are these likely to help us if war breaks out, but also your newly acquired province of Asia, and Greece, and Africa, and a considerable part of Italy itself, which even now wages implacable war against you because it cannot endure your greed. Before you are able to compose this strife, 
You attack Mithridates and set Nicomedes and Ariobarzanes on him by turns, and you say, forsooth, that you are our friends and allies. You pretend to be so, and yet you act like enemies. Come now, if at last the consequences of your acts have put you in a better frame of mind. Either restrain Nicomedes from injuring your friends and allies, in which case I promise that King Mithridates shall help you to put down the rebellion in Italy, or throw off the mask of friendship for us, or let us go to Rome and settle the dispute there. End quote. Manius Aquilius refuses to call off Nicomedes, so the two sides march their armies to meet each other. According to Appian, both sides have nearly 300,000 men. This is probably an exaggeration. The ancient sources love to inflate their numbers, but when you see a number like that, it's not out of the question that there may be more than 100,000 men on each side. When the two sides finally meet, Nicomedes' infantry and Mithridates' infantry are both in the center, and Nicomedes is slowly pushing Mithridates back, and it looks like he's going to win the day. See, Mithridates' huge, heavily armored phalanxes haven't made it to the battle. They're too slow, so they're still miles behind the rest of the army, too far away to be of any use. So Mithridates' generals, Archelaus and Neoptolemus, are forced to rely on light infantry that can't stand up to a prolonged fight. Then the teenaged Arcathius, prince of Pontus and would-be king of Cappadocia and commander of the cavalry, leads a counterattack with Mithridates' prized, scythed chariots. Appian describes the scene in a lurid fashion. Quote, the scythe-bearing chariots made a charge on the Bithynians, cutting some of them in two and tearing others to pieces. The army of Nicomedes was terrified at seeing men cut in halves and still breathing, or mangled in fragments and their parts hanging on the scythes. Overcome rather by the hideousness of the spectacle than by loss of the fight, fear took possession of their ranks. While they were thus thrown into confusion, Archelaus attacked them in front, and Neoptolemus and Arcathius, who had turned about, assailed them in the rear. They fought a long time, facing both ways. After the greater part of his men had fallen, Nicomedes fled with the remainder into Paphlagonia, although the Mithridatian phalanx had not come into the engagement at all. His camp was captured, together with a large sum of money and many prisoners. All these Mithridates treated kindly and sent to their homes with supplies for the journey thus gaining a reputation for clemency among his enemies. End quote. Manius Aquilius himself escapes from the battle, but he's only able to rally a handful of proper Roman legionaries and is once again forced to recruit local mercenaries. Mithridates attacks his little mercenary army, the mercenaries run away, and Aquilius once again manages to give Mithridates the slip. He sails to the Greek island of Lesbos, but is then captured by local citizens who are supporters of Mithridates, and he ends up a prisoner. The year is now 88 B.C., Mithridates has gained supremacy over all of Anatolia and most of the Black Sea coast. His dreamed-for empire is taking shape in reality, if only he can hold on to it. And that's going to be a difficult task, because now he's gone and prodded the Roman wolf so much that he knows there will be reprisals. It's one thing to go to war with a Roman client king. Attacking a Roman army and capturing a Roman general? That's a good way to start a war. It's around this time that Mithridates supposedly gives a speech to his men. 
Like most historical speeches before the era of audio recording, it's almost certainly made up. But the speech is interesting because it comes to us from the Roman historian Justin. And Justin's history of Mithridates is very brief, just a few short summaries of long events. But Justin's history, in turn, is a summary of an earlier work, the Philippic Histories by Pompeius Trogus, a book which has been lost for centuries, so only Justin's distilled history remains, and it is just a few paragraphs. But out of this summary, Justin keeps this long, well over a thousand word speech that Mithridates is supposed to have made. And I believe that the reason Justin does this in an otherwise condensed history is that he wants to present Mithridates' side of the story. Justin is a Roman, and his historical summary is very Rome-centric. So this is where Mithridates gets to explain to Justin's audience why he is going to war. So whether or not the speech was given as written, it's still instructive. Justin writes Mithridates' speech in the third person, which makes it a little weird and awkward at points. But here is a somewhat edited version. Quote, It were to be wished, he said, that it were still in his power to deliberate whether he should choose peace or war with the Romans but that resistance should be offered against aggressors, not even those doubted who were without hope of victory. For all men draw the sword against robbers, if not to save their lives, at least to take revenge. But since it was not now a question when they had come to hostilities, not merely in intention but in the field of battle, they must consider in what manner and with what hopes they could continue the contest which they had commenced." that he felt certain of victory if they had but courage, and that the Romans might be conquered was known not more to himself than to his soldiers, who had routed both Aquilius in Bithynia and Maltinus in Cappadocia, that he had heard that Italy itself, since the time that Rome was built, had never been fairly brought under subjection to her, but that constantly, year after year, some of its people persisted in contending for liberty and others for a share in the government, and that by many states of Italy, armies of the Romans had been cut off by the sword, and by others with a new species of insult sent under the yoke. But that not to dwell on past instances, all Italy at the present time was in arms in the Martian War, demanding not liberty but a participation in the government and the rights of citizenship." Nor was the city more grievously harassed by war from its neighbors in Italy than by intestine broils among its leading men, and that a civil war, indeed, was much more dangerous to it than an Italian one. At the same time, too, the Cimbri from Germany, many thousands of wild and savage people, had rushed upon Italy like a tempest, and that in wars with such enemies, though the Romans might be able to resist them singly, yet by them all they must be overpowered, so that he thought they would even be too much occupied to make head against his attack. That they ought therefore to take advantage of the present circumstances and seize the opportunity of increasing their power, lest if they remained inactive while the Romans were occupied, they should hereafter find greater difficulty in contending with them when they were quiet and unmolested. For it was not a question whether they should take up arms or not, but whether they should do so at a time favorable to themselves or to their enemies. That war, indeed, had been commenced against him by the Romans, when they took from him, in his minority, the greater Phrygia, a country which they had granted his father as a recompense for the succors which he had afforded them in the war against Aristonicus, and which Seleucius Callinicus had given to his great-grandfather Mithridates as a dowry with his daughter. When they required him to quit Paphlagonia, too, was not that a renewal of hostility, 
A possession which had fallen to his father, not by force of arms, but by adoption in a will, and as an inheritance on the death of its own sovereigns? That under the severity of such decrees, he had not been able to soften them by compliance, or to prevent them from assuming harsher measures towards him every day? For in what particular had he had not submitted to their requisition? Had not Phrygia and Paphlagonia been given up? Had not his son been removed from Cappadocia, which he had gained as a conqueror by the common law of nations? Yet his conquest had been forced from him by those who had nothing themselves but what they had got in war. That liberty was readily granted by the Senate to Cappadocia, liberty of which they deprived other nations on purpose to affront him. That Nicomedes had made war upon him by their direction that when he was going to avenge himself, he was obstructed by them, and that their pretense for making war on him at present would be that he had not given up his dominions to Nicomedes, the son of a public dancer, to be ravaged with impunity. That it was not the offenses of kings, but their power and majesty for which they attacked them, and that they had not acted thus against himself alone, but against all other princes at all times that they had treated his grandfather Pharnaces in the same manner, that they had made it a law to themselves to hate all kings, because they themselves had had such kings at whose names they might well blush, being either shepherds of the Aborigines, or soothsayers of the Sabines, or exiles from the Corinthians, or servants and slaves of the Etruscans, or, what was the most honorable name amongst them, the Proud, and as their founders, according to their report, were suckled by the teats of a wolf, so the whole race had the disposition of wolves, being insatiable of blood and tyranny, and eager and hungry after riches. But as for himself, if he were compared with them as to respectability of descent, he was of more honorable origin than that mixed mass of settlers, counting his ancestors on his father's side from Cyrus and Darius, the founders of the Persian Empire and on his mother's side from Alexander the Great and Seleucus Nicator, who established the Macedonian Empire. Or, if their people were compared with his own, he was at the head of nations which were not merely a match for the power of Rome, but had withstood even that of Macedonia. That none of the people under his command had ever endured a foreign yoke, or obeyed any rulers but their own native princes. For whether they looked on Cappadocia or Paphlagonia, Pontus or Bithynia, or the greater and lesser Armenia, they would find that neither Alexander, who subdued all Asia, nor any of his successors or posterity, had meddled with any one of those nations. That as to Scythia, only two kings before him, Darius and Philippus, had ventured, not indeed to reduce it, but merely to enter it, and had with difficulty secured a retreat from it. Yet that from that country he had procured a great part of his force to oppose the Romans. That he had entered on the Pontic Wars with much more timidity and diffidence, as he was then young and inexperienced. That the Scythians, in addition to their arms and courage, were defended by deserts and cold, by which was shown the great labor and danger of making war there while amidst such hardships there was not even hope of spoil from a wandering enemy, destitute not only of money but of settled habitations, but that he was now entering upon a different sort of war, for there was no climate more temperate than that of Asia, nor any country more fertile or more attractive from the number of its cities, and that they would spend a great part of their time not as in military service, but as at a festival. They had only to follow him bravely, and learn what so great an army might do under his conduct, whom they had seen seizing Cappadocia after killing its king, not with the aid of any troops, but by his own personal effort, and who alone of all mankind had subdued all Pontus and Scythia, which no one before him could safely penetrate or approach. As to his justice and generosity, he was willing to take the soldiers themselves who had experienced them as witness to what they were and he had those proofs to bring of the latter, that he alone, of all kings, possessed not only his father's dominions, but foreign kingdoms, acquired by inheritance through his liberality, 
namely Colchis, Paphlagonia, and the Bosporus. End quote. Mithridates doesn't even have to declare war on Rome. In response to his conquest of Bithynia, the Roman Republic declares war on him in 88 BC, and the Senate appoints someone you may have heard of, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, to lead an army to the east to fight Mithridates. We'll talk more about Sulla in a minute, but with all the troubles Rome is having in Italy, his army is slow in forming, and during this time of Roman inactivity, Mithridates launches a preemptive strike, not against Rome itself, nor even against one of Rome's allies, but against what he views as a fifth column seeking to undermine his new empire from within. I'm talking about Romans and people of Roman descent, tens of thousands of whom live in Anatolia. When Sulla's army arrives, these people could decide to join him, and that could present a serious threat to Mithridates' rule. Like many diaspora communities, past as well as present, Anatolian Romans are concentrated in a few cities, most of them in the more cosmopolitan coastal areas. And it's to these cities that Mithridates will now turn for help. Remember, these are independent Greek city-states, and if he's going to fight Rome directly, he's going to need all of them on his side. So in the early spring of 88 BC, Mithridates sends secret messages to his regional magistrates in a selection of Anatolian cities. He tells them that in a month's time, they are to kill all Romans living in their cities. Amazingly, this gets pulled off successfully without anyone warning the Roman diaspora community about what's coming. At least, there are no warnings that we know of. Thirty days after Mithridates sends his message, the local Greeks rise up and kill the Romans, just as they have been ordered. To be clear, this isn't just about killing Romans and eliminating this fifth column from society. The massacre has a secondary objective. It's about binding the Greek city-states to Mithridates, so he makes sure the slaughter is particularly nasty. Not only are Romans to be killed, but their bodies are to be left unburied. To rot. They're supposed to be thrown outside the city walls for vultures and wild dogs. Anyone who hides a Roman will be punished, and anyone who kills a Roman will get to keep that Roman's belongings as long as they give Mithridates his cut. The nastier the killings are, and the more people are involved, the more the Roman Republic is just going to blame everybody in these cities, which should theoretically ensure that these cities stay loyal to Mithridates. This isn't war. It's slaughter. And it's a lot like what happened in Rwanda or in the Balkans during the 1990s. Pick your genocide. All too often, the people being killed and the people doing the killing are neighbors. They might even have been friends a few days before. Appian gives us a few examples of what happens to the Romans in some specific cities, and he seems to focus on violations of the ancient rite of sanctuary. In multiple places, when the killing begins, Roman people will run to a temple of one deity or another, and in the Greco-Roman world, this is supposed to make them untouchable. A temple is a sacred place, and if you kill someone in that place, you are defiling the domain of a god, and that's the kind of thing that can get you cursed. It seems like a lot of these people really don't care. 
They're too caught in the mob mentality to really think about what they're doing. And we hear about things like old ladies being pulled away from sacred statues that they're clinging on to just to make it easier to hack them to bits. In the city of Connus, this happens to whole families, and the killing is systematic, with children killed first in front of their parents, then the women, then the men last of all. There are some exceptions, of course, as there usually are. In the city of Kos, for example, Romans who make it to the temple of Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine, are spared. But Kos is the exception and it seems that even the most peaceable cities are often willing to participate in the massacre. Appian writes about one city where the Greek residents are too squeamish to kill their own neighbors, so they hire a barbarian chief to round up the local Romans and exterminate them, and when the barbarians show up, the city militia just kind of stands by and lets them do the deed. All told, throughout Anatolia, our sources put the number of dead between 80,000 and 150,000, and either one of those extremes could be correct. But no matter how you cut it, that is a staggering death toll, particularly for a single day, particularly for the ancient world when populations are so much lower than they are in the 21st century. This kind of historical trauma leaves a scar. And if you think the Romans are immune to trauma, think again. Writing more than 500 years later, in Roman North Africa, St. Augustine of Hippo would write in his book, The City of God, quote, How miserable a spectacle was then presented, when each man was suddenly and treacherously murdered wherever he happened to be in the field or on the road, in the town, in his own home, or in the street, in the market or temple, in bed or at table. Think of the groans of the dying, the tears of the spectators, and even of the executioners themselves. For how cruel a necessity was it that compelled the hosts of these victims not only to see these abominable butcheries in their own houses, but even to perpetrate them to change their countenance suddenly from the bland kindliness of friendship, and in the midst of peace set about the business of war. And shall I say, give and receive wounds, the slain being pierced in body, the slayer in spirit. End quote. The mass murder of Romans in the spring of 88 B.C., which we now call the Asiatic Vespers, is perpetrated not by some mythical monster or uncultured barbarian. It's perpetrated at the command of one of the most highly educated, well-cultured men on the planet, a man who clearly has no shortage of human feeling. This is the enigma of Mithridates, who has just killed a smallish city's worth of people as a prophylactic measure to protect the home front. As if to put a punctuation mark on all this, Mithridates also has something special in store for Manius Aquilius, the Roman general and diplomat who had convinced Nicomedes to raid Pontus and then run off after losing a battle and gotten captured on Lesbos. Mithridates marches Aquilius throughout his realm to show him off. Then he takes him to Pergamon, where he pours molten gold down his throat, a fitting and poetic punishment for Aquilius's greed. The next year, 87 BC, as Sulla is still back in Italy preparing his Roman army, a comet appears in the sky. This comet, which we now know as Halley's Comet, mirrors the comet seen after Mithridates' birth, and people interpret it the same way. In Rome, it's seen as a bad omen and superstitious people say that Sulla's expedition to Asia is doomed to failure. 
In Pontus and the rest of the Persian-influenced world, the comet is seen as a good omen, a sure sign that the gods will favor Mithridates in the coming war. Mithridates is approximately 47 years old and will be at war with Rome on and off for the rest of his life. But as of yet, Sulla still has not gotten an army to Anatolia, so Mithridates is able to continue solidifying his position in the eastern Mediterranean and Black Sea. He executes two simultaneous military campaigns, one under the command of his head general Archelaus, and one under his own personal command. These campaigns share a common goal of uniting the Greek world. In this era of history, the Classical Era, Greece means a broad, Greek-speaking region spanning from modern-day Greece across the Bosporus and through western Anatolia, particularly along the Mediterranean coast where all those little Greek city-states are. Mithridates has secured Anatolia and most of the Mediterranean islands. But the Greek states of what we now think of as Greece, right? European Greece, Athens, Thebes, the others, those cities remain independent, and Mithridates aims to bind them to him as surely as he has bound the city-states of Anatolia. He takes a new wife, a Greek woman named Moname, who comes from the Anatolian Greek city of Stratonicea but who comes from a wealthy trading family that has contacts all over Greece. Mithridates' marriage to a Greek woman from a prominent family signals to the Greeks that while he may be half Persian, he's also one of them. Far better to join Mithridates' Greco-Persian empire than to stand alone, subject to the whims of the half-civilized Romans. Archelaus oversees the invasion of mainland Greece, which he accomplishes more with scads of gold than via military force. Most of the Greek city-states are happy to join Mithridates' empire, and where they are not, bribery is usually able to get them on his side. Only on a few occasions does Archelaus have to use his army, but when he does, the Greek cities give him no trouble at all. They're simply too divided and disorganized to oppose a massive imperial army. And just like that, mainland European Greece is added to the rapidly growing Pontic Empire. At the same time, Mithridates is personally securing control of the remaining Greek Mediterranean islands. One of these islands, Rhodes, has refused to join in the massacre of Roman expatriates, and Mithridates is going to have to take over the island by force. There's only one problem. Rhodes is heavily fortified, with immense stone walls and a harbor that can resupply the city even in wartime. The walls are topped with what our sources describe as engines, so we have to imagine some kind of catapults or similar devices for slinging rocks at enemy ships that get too close. The Rhodians have withstood a number of sieges throughout their history, so it's not as if they're being foolish or stubborn. They really believe they can win. Mithridates begins with a naval assault. Appian tells us that his fleet has more and larger ships than the opposing Rhodian fleet, but the Rhodians have an admiral named Damagoros, who's somewhat of a guru. He uses his smaller, faster ships to harass the Pontic fleet, and raids incoming and outgoing supply ships, disengaging when the heavier Pontic ships move in to engage. At one point, Demagoros sails out with six ships against twenty-five of Mithridates' larger ships. As the sun sets and dusk ensues, his little ships fall back to their harbor through some shallows, taunting Mithridates, and 
The Pontic captains pursue them, but they're unaware that there are these treacherous shallows near the mouth of the harbor, and the Rhodians end up sinking two Pontic ships and causing two others to run aground. In another engagement, Mithridates himself gets a little too close to the action, and some of his other ships have to sail out and rescue him. And in all the confusion, an allied ship from the city of Chios accidentally rams his ship and almost sinks it. As we'll see in a few minutes, Mithridates will never fully accept that the ramming was an accident, and he will become suspicious of the city of Chios. After a few failed naval attacks on the city of Rhodes, Mithridates decides that he cannot win by sea alone. He'll need to attack by land at the same time, thereby spreading out Rhodes' defenses, wearing them thin, and presenting opportunities to break into the city. So, Mithridates calls for reinforcements from home. But As the reinforcing army is sailing to Rhodes, a storm blows in and scatters all their ships, and Demagoros immediately sails out with the Rhodian fleet and drives some of them away, captures other ships, and sinks and burns others. He even takes 400 of Mithridates' sailors prisoner. Mithridates tries a third attack on Rhodes this time with a bigger army and heavy seaborne siege equipment. His army hides on transport ships and deploys on the beach at night. The army then follows a group of Rhodian deserters to a poorly defended spot in the city walls. This should be an effective means of attack, except it turns out that the whole thing was a trick, and Rhodian agents have known all along where along the wall the Pontic army would attack. When Mithridates' troops attack the very well-defended stretch of wall, they are driven back. Defeating the army by trickery was relatively simple. But the Rhodians are much more worried about Mithridates' fleet, which has now deployed a massive ship-mounted siege tower called a Sambuca. This tower spans across two ships with a large bridge-like structure across the top, not unlike a pontoon boat. This bridge-like structure has catapults and battering rams deployed across it, and a ramp for troops to run across onto Rhodes's city walls. The tower slowly moves in, creaking on its two transport ships, and smaller ships sail along with it, filled with troops who plan to climb the Sambuca and run across the ramps as soon as it's in place. Unfortunately for Mithridates, the Sambuca is a very ambitious structure to build out of wood, and it collapses while it is still lumbering towards the walls of Rhodes, and yet another attack has failed. At this point, Mithridates returns to Anatolia and delegates the war to his generals. Not that he's sitting idle, He's engaged in the hard work of administration, raising armies, equipping those armies, and making sure no rebellions break out in all his newly conquered lands. But he needs to act fast on the military front. The Roman wolf has finally gotten its act together, and no fewer than five legions are sailing across the Adriatic to enforce Rome's supremacy in the eastern Mediterranean. As I've mentioned, the Roman army marching into Greece is commanded by Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Sulla is a popular politician and general who had helped defeat Jugurtha in North Africa and previously spent time in Anatolia as the governor of Rome's province of Asia. He'd first been elected as consul in 88 BC and had planned to march straight to Greece. 
but he'd gotten into an internal Roman political dispute, been betrayed by his enemies, and the Senate had removed him from command of the army. Furious, Sulla had turned around his army, marched on Rome, and killed or exiled his political enemies. And this will in no way set any kind of precedent or encourage future disgruntled Roman generals to march on Rome when they don't get their way. Anyway, by the fall of 87 BC, Sulla has finally gotten Rome's act together and begins his attack on Greece. A number of Greek city-states immediately switch sides and join the Romans, and Archelaus decides to defend the southern half of Greece rather than spread his forces out around the entire Greek mainland. So, Archelaus sets up in the city of Athens and prepares for a long siege. Defending Athens is more difficult than defending Rhodes. While the city of Rhodes has its own natural harbor with a tall wall, the city of Athens is situated a few miles inland and carries out naval trade via the nearby port of Piraeus, which is approximately 3.7 miles away. To prevent the city from getting cut off in the event of a siege, Athens is connected to Piraeus by a narrow, walled-off corridor appropriately named the Long Walls. Then again, Archelaus has considerable manpower to defend those walls, as many as 400,000 men, according to the ancient sources, and even, again, if it's only 100,000, that's a large defensive force to fight a total of around 40,000 Roman legionaries and auxiliaries. Much like Mithridates outside of Rhodes, Sulla outside of Athens makes several attempts to attack the city in various ways. Archelaus, for his part, more than once tries to force an open battle, and more than once gets drawn into a trap by Roman spies. This does not break the Pontic army, it does not lose them a ton of men, it just means they're not able to use their superior numbers to overwhelm the Romans in an open fight. Sulla is stubborn and he's willing to do almost anything to force Athens back into the Roman fold. So he sends to the Greek cities who have already surrendered to him and demands that they send him all the treasures in their religious temples so he can pay his men. Writing a century and a half later, the Greek historian Plutarch, who is not a fan of Sulla, writes about the theft of a particular treasure a massive silver jar that an ancient king had given to the oracle at Delphi. And Plutarch ties this into what he would call the declining moral fiber of Roman leadership. He writes, quote, The silver jar, the only one of the royal gifts which still remained, was too large and heavy for any beast of burden to carry and the Amphictyons were compelled to cut it into pieces. As they did so, they called to mind now Titus Flaminius and Manius Achilleus and now Aminius Paulus, of whom one had driven Antiochus out of Greece and the others had subdued in war the kings of Macedonia. These had not only spared the sanctuaries of the Greeks, but had even made additional gifts to them and greatly increased their honor and dignity. But these were lawful commanders of men who were self-restrained and had learned to serve their leaders without a murmur. And they were themselves kingly in spirit and simple in their personal expenses, and indulged in moderate and specified public expenditures, deeming it more disgraceful to flatter their soldiers than to fear their enemies. The generals of this latter time, however, who won their primacy by force, not merit, and who needed their armies for service against one another rather than against the public enemy, were compelled to merge the general and the demagogue. And then, by purchasing the services of their soldiers with lavish sums to be spent on luxurious living, they unwittingly made their whole country a thing for sale, 
and themselves slaves of the basest men for the sake of ruling over the better. End quote. Self-obsessed conqueror or not, Sulla eventually takes Athens in March of 86 BC, when some of his men overhear some of Archelaus's sentries talking about an undefended stretch of wall, and Sulla launches a night attack, breaks into the city, and forces Archelaus to beat a quick retreat. In the confusion and violence, tens of thousands of Mithridates' troops are killed or captured. Sulla may not have taken all of Greece, but he's driven the Pontic army out of Greece's most prestigious city-state, as well as inflicting a major defeat on an army much larger than his own. Mithridates stews in Pontus, too far from the action to do anything, but wait for reports from the war front. In Greece, both sides are gathering reinforcements, but since he already has the numerical advantage, this can only work against Archelaus. So he forces Sulla into an immediate battle by attacking one of the Roman allied city-states, a place called Chironia. Here, the huge size of the Pontic army and its reliance on slow, lumbering pike formations will work against it. Knowing he's outnumbered, Sulla chooses to lead the stronger right flank of his army, while leaving his left flank with a minimal number of troops. The idea is for Sulla to win quickly on the right flank and then hopefully go help the guys on the left if they were able to hold. But then this small number of troops on the Roman left flank surprises everybody by launching a downhill attack on the first ranks of Pontic infantry. These Romans charge out of the trees down a slope towards these Pontic infantry, who seem to be taken totally by surprise, and they try to run away, and the Romans kill 3,000 of them in the process. Now, behind these Pontic infantry, who the guys on the Roman left flank have just driven back, behind them, Archelaus had been preparing the famous Pontic scythed chariots, getting them ready for a charge. They were supposed to come in after the infantry and strike the killing blow, but now with the infantry retreating, there's no room for the chariots to build up a full head of steam. There's no open space in front of them. So when they try to countercharge the Romans, they're only moving at half speed. And the well-trained legionaries are able to split their ranks, form empty lanes, and allow the chariots to pass harmlessly through. When the chariots stop to turn around and charge the Romans from the rear, a group of Roman javelin men ambushes them and spears them while they're stationary and helpless. The Roman legionaries next charge into a Pontic phalanx, where the pikemen actually give them a lot of trouble. A lot of the guys in the front Pontic ranks are freed slaves, and if the Romans capture them, they're going to crucify them, so you can bet that these guys in particular are fighting their hearts out. So far, despite the damage done to his chariots and his front ranks of infantry, everything is still playing into Archelaus' plan. Yes, the loss of the chariots is unfortunate, but he still has the numerical advantage, and the overall tactical plan is still the same. Pin the Romans in place with the pike phalanxes, then send cavalry around the flanks to hit them in their rear. So now that the Roman legionaries are engaged with the pike phalanxes, Archelaus sends out his cavalry. But the tactics he's using have been developed over centuries of Greek and Persian armies dealing with phalanxes and other phalanx-style infantry. The Romans use swords, not spears, and their formations are far more nimble. When the Pontic cavalry close in for the kill, 
The legionaries simply have the guys in their back and side ranks turn around and they cluster up into a hedgehog formation, which makes it impossible for them to move or attack anybody, but it also makes them extraordinarily resistant to attack from all directions. Even so, the Roman left flank is in bad shape. Right, it's charged through a bunch of Pontic troops, and now it's being attacked from all sides, and it's in this hedgehog formation with the men waiting for help. And at this point, Sulla actually takes a bunch of men from his right flank, where he'd been commanding, and he leads them over to the left flank to help out. Archelaus decides that it's not worth sending more cavalry against this reinforced left flank. But Sulla has now weakened his right flank by moving all these men over. So Archelaus leads his cavalry back around his own army to attack the Romans from the other side. And here's where he gets into trouble very quickly. See, two things happen at once. Uh, to begin with, Archelaus has to take his cavalry around a fairly wide distance to get around his very large army. So the Romans have a lot of time to react. It's sort of like a slow-developing football play where you can see the tailback sweeping from one side to the other, and the defense has all day to key up on him. The other thing that happens is that Archelaus orders the Pontic infantry to fall back. They're supposed to do this in good order, basically to give the men a little bit of a breather and force the Romans to march closer to the incoming cavalry charge if they want to engage. But the Roman legionaries move faster than lumbering phalanxes, and when the Pontic troops try to disengage and back up, the Romans catch up with them very quickly and start stabbing guys in the back. So all of a sudden, what's supposed to be an organized tactical redeployment turns into a panicked retreat back to the next line of phalanxes, which protect the main Pontic camp. Archelaus gets inside the camp with the retreating men and then closes the camp gates behind them. Apparently it's a walled camp, and he orders the phalanxes who had been guarding outside to hold the line. Inside, he scrambles to reorganize the men who had retreated and get them back into the fight, but the Romans don't give him a breather. They just keep coming. Philip Matizak writes, quote, with the left and right flanks gone, the phalanx stood little chance. Whilst its multiple ranks of spears made it almost invincible from the front, the Romans, hardened by years of fighting the similarly armed Macedonians, had long known that there was nothing that phalangites hated more than hostile troops at the sides and rear. Those same massed ranks of spears made turning sideways to fight extremely difficult. While dropping the spears to achieve this, pitted lightly armed men with tiny shields against well-armed legionaries. The phalanx crumbled into a mass of panicked men scrambling for the safety of the camp, a safety which the guards at the gates were reluctant to give without orders, and Archelaus was still rapidly insisting that his men fight to the last. When finally it became apparent, even to Archelaus, that the day was lost, the gates of the camp were opened, but the Pontic commander had left it too late. The Romans burst in on the heels of their fleeing enemies, and once they were in the camp, the rout was complete. End quote. Sulla's army tears through the Pontic camp, slaughtering hundreds. The lighter armed and armored Pontic troops might still be able to salvage a clean retreat, but Sulla has held his cavalry back the entire battle, and now he lets them loose to pursue his retreating enemies. Archelaus and his men eventually get to some ships where they're able to sail out to sea, but out of something like 120,000 troops he'd started the day with, the Pontic commander-in-chief is left with only 10,000. Mithridates sends some reinforcements under the command of his friend Dorilaus. 
These men link up with Archelaus' army, and they have another go with the Romans at a place called Orchomenus. Archelaus tries a different tactic this time and intentionally orders his phalanxes to withdraw to lure the Romans into a premature charge. When the Roman legions chase the phalanxes like they did before, he sends in his cavalry to attack the Romans in the open field and give his phalanxes time to reform. Unfortunately, Sulla has been expecting this and sends in his own cavalry to countercharge the Pontic cavalry. Archelaus has way more cavalry than Sulla does, but the Roman cavalry is able to slow them down enough that the legionaries are able to catch up and the combined force of Roman cavalry and infantry drives the Pontic cavalry from the field. Then, exactly like at Chironia, the Romans just keep on charging. The Pontic phalanxes don't have time to reform, the legionaries slaughter them, and then they break into the Pontic camp and slaughter a lot of the people inside. Archelaus himself is nearly captured and has to hide in a swamp for two days before the Romans clear the area and he's able to rejoin his few remaining men. With the exception of Archelaus's tiny force, which is now operating as a pirate fleet raiding Roman trade, the Pontic army has been pushed out of mainland Greece altogether. These events are humiliating for the Pontic king, who starts looking for someone to blame for his setbacks. First, Mithridates separates from Monome, his Greek bride, and he locks her in the same tower as his virgin sisters. Next, he massacres a bunch of local leaders in Galatia, which is a region in central Anatolia. The Galatian people are unlike the rest of Mithridates' subjects because they are neither Persian nor Greek descended. They are of Celtic origin, as are many of the subjects of the Roman Republic, which, in Mithridates' state of budding paranoia, means that the Galatians might be working with the Romans. So he decides to just kill a whole bunch of their leaders, and many of the Galatian leaders Mithridates kills are his own friends and supporters, who he gathers together for a feast before having them all killed Red Wedding style. Unsurprisingly, this backfires and a bunch of surviving Galatian leaders launch an uprising that forces Mithridates to temporarily withdraw from the region and which ties down valuable Pontic troops who have to come into the area and restore order. In another incident, Mithridates decides to issue a bit of payback for that one time a ship from the city of Chios had accidentally rammed his ship. He's now convinced it was a deliberate ramming, so he sends a general named Zenobius to Chios with an army. Because Pontus is supposed to be Chios' senior partner in an alliance, the people of the city don't hesitate to let Zenobius and his men in, and they offer them hospitality. Overnight, Zenobius has his men seize the city walls and all the defensive towers around the city, and then he rounds up all the citizens and he gives a speech. He tells them that Mithridates is angry with them for being big fans of the Romans, but that Mithridates will forgive them if they hand over the city's weapons and the children of the ruling citizens, just as a guarantee of good behavior. The people of Chios agree they don't really have a choice at this point, and the city's leaders hand over their children as hostages, and Zenobius withdraws from the city, telling them all that he will write to Mithridates and see if their offer of good faith is significant enough to forestall his wrath. A few days later, he once again gathers the people of Chios in the central square and reads them Mithridates' reply. Quote, you favor the Romans even now, and many of your citizens are still sojourning with them. You are reaping the fruits of Roman property of which you do not make returns to us. 
Your trireme ran against and shook my ship in the battle before Rhodes. I willingly imputed that fault to the pilots alone, hoping that you would observe the rules of safety and remain my submissive subjects. Now you have secretly sent your chief men to Sulla, and you have never proved or declared that this was done without public authority, as was the duty of those who were not cooperating with them. Although my friends consider that those who conspire against my government, and who intend to conspire against my person, ought to suffer death, I will let you off with a fine of two thousand talents. End quote. Once again, the people of Chios have little choice. They gather up all their valuables and their temples and their homes, and they give Zenobius two thousand talents worth of gold. Once again, he gathers all the citizens in the city square, and he accuses them of intentionally shorting the weight. Then his soldiers move in, herd the unarmed people onto ships, and sell them all into slavery. This is what Mithridates orders done to an entire city because a couple of guys on a boat accidentally rammed his ship. Although it's worth noting that Chios had previously been renowned for its slave markets, so there's a bit of irony in the fact that many of the people who were sold into slavery had themselves been slavers. Anyway, General Zenobius next marches his army to Ephesus, which is another city in Anatolia that Mithridates suspects of being disloyal to him. Word has gotten around about what he did in Chios, so the people of Ephesus refuse to let in Zenobius's army, only Zenobius himself and a small honor guard. He demands to immediately address the city assembly, but the assembly delays and says that they can't possibly get everybody together today, but they can meet tomorrow morning. Overnight, the leaders of Ephesus meet in secret, and in the morning, they have General Zenobius arrested, imprisoned, and then executed. They call up the militia to man the city walls, and send out messengers to other nearby cities who have also heard about what happened in Chios, and those cities send their own militias to help out the Ephesians. So Mithridates now faces yet another revolt in Anatolia, and he has to divert more troops who should be going to Greece to instead deal with this threat that he has basically created for himself. If that's not enough, Mithridates is also losing control over all the little islands in the eastern Mediterranean and Aegean seas. See, a few months back... Sulla had dispatched one of his top lieutenants, a man named Lucullus, who will be important later in our story. He's important now because Sulla sends him to buy a navy, and Sulla had basically given Lucullus a bunch of gold and told him to find ships wherever he can. Lucullus has found an entire fleet in Egypt, which King Ptolemy IX basically gives him for free, and Lucullus is now sailing that fleet around the eastern Mediterranean, taking over all of those little Greek islands. Just as bad, while he's sailing around, he's also wreaking havoc on Pontic trade, causing serious damage to the Anatolian economy as well as Mithridates' royal finances. Mithridates knows a losing hand when he sees one, and he sends a message to Archelaus ordering him to contact Sulla and begin peace negotiations. So Archelaus does this, and the two of them hammer out a general peace agreement before Mithridates can even travel to Greece to meet with Sulla himself. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of stuff going on with Roman politics that throws a monkey wrench into the negotiations and extends the war. Back in Rome, a couple of Sulla's enemies have taken control of the government. 
One is Gaius Marius, the guy who had put down Jugurtha's North African rebellion, among many other exploits, and the other is Lucius Cornelius Cinna, an ambitious politician who has gotten elected by criticizing Sulla for his march on Rome, which was clearly illegal. As consul, Cinna has Sulla's friends and family members enslaved or killed, and he seizes all their belongings, which is also clearly illegal. Moreover, Cinna also takes the totally legal step of working with Gaius Marius to convince the Senate to cut off Sulla's military funding and remove him as general. The Senate dispatches new legions to the east to replace the old ones, and these legions are led by a guy named Flaccus. Along the way, Flaccus and his legions stop near Byzantium to resupply, and here's where the story gets a little muddy. See, there's this guy named Fimbria, who is either Flaccus's lieutenant or a civilian advisor, our sources don't agree, but Flaccus seems to be an unpopular leader, while Fimbria is popular among the men. So, Fimbria either kills Flaccus himself or stirs up the troops to kill him, and Fimbria takes command of these legions from Rome. Now Mithridates is dealing with Sulla, who the Senate has stripped of power, Fimbria, who is a mutineer, and the only Romans with legal authority to accept his surrender are in the Senate, who are way back in Rome. Worse yet, Mithridates has hardly any troops in Anatolia to defend the homeland. Remember, he'd sent almost all of his men to Greece. Well, Fimbria takes his men across from Greece to Anatolia and aggressively pursues Mithridates, plundering all the way. My three sources for this campaign... Appian, Cassius Dio, and Plutarch contradict each other on several points. So, what I'm about to give you is my best stab at a reconstruction of the events of late 86 BC through early 85 BC. Fimbria knows that he is in big trouble for orchestrating the death of Flaccus and stealing his legions. If he doesn't want to get executed for rebellion, Fimbria is going to have to do something to impress the Senate. That's why he pursues Mithridates so aggressively. He wants to be the guy to capture this troublesome king of Pontus and haul him back to Rome in irons. If he can achieve something like that, the Senate will have little choice but to accept his seizure of Flaccus' legions as legitimate. So Fimbria chases Mithridates all the way back to Pontus, where they fight a battle that Mithridates loses, and our hero is forced to fall back to a coastal city called Pitane, where Fimbria besieges him. Now, there's not much that Sulla can do about this. Remember, he's trying to make peace with Mithridates as well, uh, but he and his army are over in European Greece with Archelaus and what's left of the Pontic army. But Sulla's lieutenant, Lucullus, the guy who brought the fleet up from Egypt, uh, he is able to attack Fimbria's troops outside Pitane and force the mutinous Fimbrian legions to withdraw. Mithridates is then able to surrender to Lucullus, while Archelaus and Sulla agree to final terms. According to the terms of the peace treaty, Mithridates is to return all the land he had conquered in Greece and Anatolia and restore the local kingdoms to their rightful rulers. But when Mithridates and Sulla finally get together, Mithridates tries to renegotiate by saying that Everything he did, he did because of abuses by corrupt Roman generals. In Sulla, who's famous for being this sort of old-school throwback figure who's big on all the old Roman virtues, he's not having any of it. 
According to Appian, he goes on this long diatribe about how Mithridates is a warmonger who wants to conquer all the East, and how he attacked his neighbors without provocation, and murdered innocent Roman women and children, and murdered and enslaved even his friends during his paranoia. And Sulla finishes by saying, quote, after you had confiscated the property of all your victims, you crossed over to Europe with great armies, although we had forbidden the invasion of Europe to all the kings of Asia. You overran our province of Macedonia and deprived the Greeks of their freedom. Nor did you begin to repent and tell Archelaus to intercede for you until I had recovered Macedonia and delivered Greece from your grasp and destroyed 160,000 of your soldiers and taken your camps with all their belongings. I'm astonished that you should now seek to justify the acts for which you asked pardon through Archelaus. If you feared me at a distance, do you think that I have come into your neighborhood to have a debate with you? The time for that passed when you took up arms against us, and we vigorously repelled your assaults and repelled them to the end. End quote. After this dressing down by Sulla, Mithridates agrees to the original peace terms and gives back the territories he had taken in Greece and Anatolia, and he also agrees to pay war reparations. And what's interesting about this is that it's actually quite lenient for a Roman peace agreement. Normally, when the Romans beat you in a war, they want you to become a Roman client or send all your kids to live in Rome as hostages or let the Romans have all your slaves or something like that. But Sulla makes things pretty easy for Mithridates and the reason is pretty obvious. He wants to get back home. Remember, he has no legal authority to command his legions. His men are only staying loyal for now because while they were in Greece, he led them in raids against a bunch of neutral barbarians and let the men keep all the barbarians' valuables. At some point, he's going to have to relinquish command or regain legal authority. By the way, Mithridates also better hope that Sulla is successful because... Uh, if he's not, uh, this whole peace treaty Mithridates has made is going to be null and void. Uh, meanwhile, back in Rome, Sulla's enemies, Cinna and Gaius Marius, have either killed his family and friends or driven them into exile, and they are gaining more power in Rome by the day. Sulla doesn't have time to spend another year or two or three fighting Mithridates in Anatolia, so he makes the lenient peace deal that he needs to make and he heads home to Rome. This marks the end of what historians call the First Mithridatic War. But the First Mithridatic War has an interesting little coda that we call the Second Mithridatic War. See, when Sulla withdraws to go back to Italy, Mithridates has a new problem. Fimbria's legions are still in Anatolia. Through some shenanigans we won't get into, those legions have now fallen under the command of the new Roman governor of Asia, a guy named Lucius Licinius Marina. But historians still call these legions the Fimbrian legions, and that's what I will continue to call them. Anyway, Lucius Licinius Marina knows that without Senate ratification, Sulla's treaty with Mithridates isn't worth the papyrus it's printed on. So he takes the Fimbrian legions and starts raiding Pontus. Mithridates really doesn't want another war with Rome right now, so he sends a protest to the Senate. And despite the fact that the Senate hasn't ratified Sulla's peace deal yet... They do send a message to Marina ordering him to stop raiding Pontic land. Apparently the Senate is also sick of war with Mithridates, but Marina ignores their letter and continues his unsanctioned invasion of Pontus. So Mithridates calls his armies back up and he attacks the Fimbrian legions while they're on one of their deep raids into Pontic territory. 
and he drives them back into Roman Anatolia, where Marina seems to keep a leash on them for the time being. Meanwhile, over in Italy, Sulla has gained the loyalty of much of the army, while Gaius Marius and Cinna command what amounts to thousands of urban proles armed with clubs and roof tiles. Like he did not so long ago, Sulla once again marches into Rome and defeats his enemies. This time, he posts a list of proscriptions, or people who are to be executed on sight. And the proscription list grows longer every day until thousands of people, anyone who so much as shook hands with Gaius Marius one time in the marketplace, they're all executed. In fact, many of the people who are executed had nothing to do with Gaius Marius or Cinna, but are simply unlucky enough to own property that one of Sulla's allies wants, and anyone who kills someone on the proscription list gets to keep the dead person's stuff. So it's not too hard to see how that system could be abused and how all kinds of innocent people could get proscribed, and that's exactly what happens. Sulla's second march on Rome, much like his first, will definitely not set any kind of precedent or encourage future disgruntled Roman generals to march on Rome when they don't get their way. For the purposes of our story, Sulla's march on Rome puts him firmly in command of the Roman state. The Senate quickly votes to retroactively approve all of his actions, including his peace treaty with Mithridates, and in addition to getting the peace treaty formally approved, Sulla also fires Marina, that Roman governor who had attacked Mithridates, bringing a quick end to the Second Mithridatic War by the end of 82 BC. During his meeting with Sulla, Mithridates had supposedly told the Roman general that Romans are greedy and untrustworthy, but that he knows he can negotiate with Sulla because Sulla is an honorable man. It's tempting to chalk this up to flattery, but if you look at Mithridates' actions in the wake of his peace treaty with Rome, there may be something to this. For the next couple of years, he behaves himself. It's not until Sulla retires in 80 BC that Mithridates once again starts building an army and planning new conquests. Mithridates has learned a number of lessons, both from his own army's performance on the battlefield and from the Roman army's superior performance against them. On paper, it was the Pontic army which had been far superior often fielding several times as many men as their Roman opponents. Yet, that massive size had often worked against them, as we've already seen on the battlefield, with large groups of soldiers cramming together and causing confusion, or creating obstacles for other troops that are trying to maneuver. Beyond the battlefield, the army's size has made it incredibly expensive to maintain and supply and many of the troops are only useful for certain specialized tasks. We mentioned this. Mithridates has allowed troops from throughout his domain to fight in their own local styles. In theory, this makes it easy to raise an army since he hasn't had to train a bunch of people in one singular fighting style. The troops just show up with their traditional weapons and armor, and Mithridates' generals use them as best they can. So again, you get oodles of soldiers, right? But in most situations, most of these soldiers are just dead weight. There was one historian I read, and please forgive me, I don't remember who it was or I would cite them by name here, but this person was talking about these guerrilla soldiers Mithridates had recruited in the Balkans, while most of the fighting in Greece was done in open battle. General Archelaus had to supply all these guerrilla fighters while they added nothing to his ability to win a battle. They just sat in camp and ate the provisions he bought for them. 
So Mithridates gets rid of all the unique little local troops, except for his Scythian horsemen, armored cataphracts, and scythed chariots. That mix of Eastern-style cavalry has worked very well for him on the battlefield, but other than that, he gets rid of all the uh, other local units that are just weighing him down. On the other hand, even Mithridates' old-school pike phalanxes have been a total disaster. There's a reason the Romans have been dominating Greek armies on the battlefield for a while now, and it's their superior mobility and maneuverability. A phalanx is a formidable obstacle on the battlefield, but that's pretty much all it is. An obstacle. We're talking about huge blocks of men, as many as 16 ranks deep or even more, all packed shoulder to shoulder and wielding huge pikes. You don't want to run into them from the front, and you also don't want them to run into you, but they have to move slowly if they want to maintain cohesion, so you'll probably have time to get out of their way if they're coming at you. And... It's this maneuverability issue that's the big problem with phalanxes. It's tough to turn a big block of men around and change direction without breaking your tight formation. A little obstacle like a shrub that a single man could just walk around becomes a major roadblock when you're trying to keep that many men as tightly packed as possible. So if anything unexpected happens on the battlefield which it almost always will, it's difficult to redeploy your men. It's even harder when you're in tight quarters and not fighting in a big open plain. And that is assuming that the phalanx even shows up to the fight. The formations are so slow and cumbersome that more than once they've actually been late to a battle, and troops that don't even show up are obviously useless. Mithridates totally scraps the pike phalanxes and replaces them with smaller, cohort-style units of around 500 men, armed and armored in the Roman style, with swords instead of spears and armor designed for mobility. The smaller, faster military units are easier to maneuver on the battlefield, they're less vulnerable to attacks from the flank, and they can form up quickly in the event of an unexpected encounter with the enemy. The new Pontic army will be far more effective than the old one. It'll be more lightweight, faster and nimble in battle, and will be one of the few armies to be worthy of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Romans. The retooling and retraining will also take a while so it will be several years before Mithridates is ready to go to war again. I should also mention at this time that somebody had to take the fall for the Pontic army's failure in Greece, and as the general in command, Archelaus ends up being that fall guy. He actually ends up becoming a friend of Sulla during their negotiations, and then he works for him and other Romans in later campaigns, including campaigns against Mithridates. So he's going to be all right, and we'll see him later in our story. As for the Pontic army, Mithridates has a simple solution. Since the army has never lost a battle with him in command, he is going to lead them personally from now on. No more hanging back in Sinope doing administrative work. During the nine years between the Second and Third Mithridatic Wars, foreshadowing, Pontic culture is flourishing. Mithridates is a lover of fine pottery, and the kingdom's agate, onyx, and gold provide ample working material. Pontus is also famous for its fine jewelry, and samples of pottery and jewelry from this period can be found in museums throughout the world. Needless to say, this kind of stuff sells for a small fortune in the ancient Mediterranean, and the tax revenue is enough to provide for a large royal treasury. 
Mithridates is also said to be fond of music. One story tells of a royal feast where he hires a female harpist, and he's so enchanted by her music that he takes her straight to bed with him and makes her his favorite concubine. Her father, a regular guy from some village, wakes up the next morning to find a bunch of palace eunuchs in his tiny thatched hut carrying gifts from the king. It seems like there's always a feast of one kind or another going on in Mithridates' palace, and the king of Pontus is famous for not just his appetite, but his ability to hold his liquor. Like Alexander the Great, he often participates in drinking contests, and these are serious affairs where more than one person has drank himself to death, although Mithridates also makes a habit of letting his guests win from time to time. Of course, our hero's fascination for poison continues unabated, and he continues taking his daily universal antidote. Along the way, he continues to experiment with all kinds of substances to study their effects on the human body. And being the kind of stand-up guy that he is, Mithridates makes sure to follow the latest guidelines in the field of research ethics, which in this time and place means that he only ever performs experiments on condemned criminals. It should come as no surprise that he often interweaves his various passions, so the study of poison becomes part of the entertainment for his feasts. In The Poison King, Adrian Mayer invites us to envision one such scene. Quote, as the guests take their places on couches, turbaned Hindus might charm cobras with sinuous flute music, and silly serpent handlers allow themselves to be bitten by Libyan adders. Scythian shamans milk venom from the fangs of a steppe viper. Dipping an arrowhead in the poison, a Scythian archer shoots the criminal, the arrow zipping over the heads of the guests. On another evening, the old root cutter, Crataeus, might measure out some dread plant poison. With a flourish, he sprinkles it atop a tasty dish and serves it to another condemned man. Mithridates provides learned commentary as everyone observes the result of the poison. Suspense builds as servants proffer the same dish to the guests, minus the poison, of course. Meanwhile, the dying victims were quickly carried out of sight for secret experiments with antidotes. With grand gestures and banter, Mithridates awes the guests by swallowing a drop of snake venom. For the climax of the evening, the poison king invites the guests to salt his own plate of roast lamb or his wine cup with arsenic or belladonna. Mithridates was not only a toxicologist, he was a magus, a magician. Both skills came into play in creating his image of invincibility. End quote. Incidentally, Mithridates' trick of drinking snake venom is easy to explain. The type of venom we're talking about is perfectly safe to drink. It's only harmful when it's injected into the body and gets into the blood. Of course, if you didn't know that, it would be an astounding magic trick. Being a man of many appetites, Mithridates takes several wives and concubines during this time, and he has several more children. None of them ever become terribly important, but just know that they exist and that there are many, many people today who can credibly claim to be descended from Mithridates. He's kind of like Genghis Khan that way. There is one wife worth mentioning, though, and this is someone that Mithridates may have met sometime during this period of peace, or it may be someone that he meets later. Adrian Mayer puts it several years later. All we know for sure is that she meets Mithridates sometime between the end of the Second Mithridatic War in 81 BC and 
66 BC when Plutarch mentions her at a battle. At that point, she disappears from history again, although we do know that she stays with Mithridates until her death. This woman is named Hypsicrateia, and while she's only described in two paragraphs that I can find in the ancient sources, she's one of the most fascinating personalities in the entire story. Now, it's impossible to say for sure, but based on her name, Historians believe that Hypsicrateia comes from one of the horse tribes in the Caucasus Mountains near Armenia. Her bearing supports this, since Plutarch tells us that, quote, "...mounted and accoutred like a Persian, she was neither exhausted by the long journeys, nor did she weary of caring for the king's person and for his horse." End quote. Writing a century later, the Roman historian Valerius Maximus would say, quote, Hypsicrateia the queen also so entirely loved Mithridates her husband that she gave full rein to her affections. For love of him, she clothed her beauty in a man's costume and accustomed herself to virile exercises, cutting her hair and using a horse and weapons so that she might the more easily share in his labors and dangers, end quote. Hypsicrateia comes from a far-off and exotic land. She's a horse-archer warrior queen who can dress up and pass herself off as a man, who can even keep up and excel in the heat of battle. She's like this mythic figure come to life and spilling out into our history books, and I wish I knew more about her. For Mithridates, a king about to go to war against the most powerful army in the world, Hypsicrateia is the perfect bride. In 74 BC, this period of peace and prosperity, the last peaceful period of Mithridates' life, will come to a sudden end. King Nicomedes IV of Bithynia dies. Now, Remember, Bithynia is that country in northwestern Anatolia, right next to Pontus. And when Nicomedes dies, he leaves this land, right on Mithridates' doorstep, not to one of his heirs, but to the Roman Republic, much like Mad King Attalus had given the kingdom of Pergamon to the Romans two generations before. This installation of the corrupt, greedy Romans as the leaders of Greco-Persian land is an insult Mithridates cannot and will not tolerate. He claims the right to the throne of Bithynia for himself and declares war. To ensure victory, Appian tells us that he rides his chariot into the sea, drawn by beautiful white horses that all become a sacrifice to the sea god Poseidon. For victory on land, Mithridates makes a pilgrimage to the temple of Zeus Stratios, where he makes a sacrifice. Now, a lot of people, modern people, misread Appian and think that Mithridates makes a sacrifice to Zeus. But that's not what Appian says. He says Zeus Stratios, who is not Zeus the Greek god of thunder, but a Hellenized version of Ahura Mazda the Zoroastrian creator deity. And there's a temple to Zeus Stratios slash Ahura Mazda on a hill overlooking the tombs of the ancient Pontic kings. These kings aren't buried at the city of Sinope, where Mithridates rules and was born, but further inland at a place called Amasia, where their tombs are carved into tall vertical rock faces. Mithridates may have sacrificed his chariot to the Greek sea god, but with his sacrifice to Zeus Stratios slash Uhura Mazda, he's getting back to his Persian roots as well. And with that, he assembles his retooled army to invade Bithynia. As with his previous conquests, Mithridates does not intend to go it alone. He plans to get Rome embroiled in a two-front war, a war which will stretch Roman resources to their breaking point. To this end, 
In 73 BC, he formalizes an alliance with a Roman rebel named Quintus Sertorius. Well, the word rebel doesn't really do justice to who Sertorius is because he's not just some guy. Uh, Sertorius is a respected general who had sided with Cinna and Gaius Marius during the Civil War and had been with them in Rome as Sulla's army closed in. Sertorius had seen which way the wind was blowing and gotten out of Rome with most of his soldiers before Sulla even arrived. He had fled to Iberia and set up a base of resistance with other Roman soldiers who had chosen the losing side in the Civil War. He had also joined up with a much larger number of Iberian tribesmen who prefer Sertorius's populist style to the rule of Sulla's far more conservative and ethnocentric party. The interesting thing is that the alliance with Sertorius is negotiated over a period of several years during the 70s BC. So, while it isn't formalized until after the death of Nicomedes IV, negotiations had been well underway and Mithridates had obviously been planning for war for years. Why? Appian tells us that Mithridates speaks to his men, reminding them of Roman greed and of his right to rule Anatolia in light of his royal Greco-Persian heritage. But this is propaganda, as are most speeches by most leaders. And in fact, Mithridates has had a strong national security argument to prepare for war even before Nicomedes' death. In his book, The Foreign Policy of Mithridates VI Eupator, King of Pontus, Irish historian Brian McKing writes, quote, Many have assumed that the real cause of the war was the death of Nicomedes IV and the Roman annexation of Bithynia. This is not, in fact, stated in any of our sources. However likely it may be that Mithridates would find Roman control of the entrance to the Black Sea totally unacceptable. For Appian, the decisive point was apparently the king's treaty with Sertorius, which, as I have argued already, took place before Nicomedes' death. This agreement and the subsequent preparations of Mithridates were proof of his decision to go to war. Nicomedes' death and the inheritance of Bithynia by Rome merely made it immediately necessary and provided the opportunity to implement his plans. So, what caused the king to precipitate war by allying himself to Sertorius? Perhaps Nicomedes' health had been failing seriously for some time. In line with the recent Roman interest in Cyrene, for so long virtually ignored by the Senate, it might have appeared likely that Rome was also intending to fill the vacuum in Bithynia when Nicomedes died. Or, possibly, it was generally known before his death that Nicomedes planned to bequeath his kingdom to Rome. Mithridates could not accept this situation, so it was virtually inevitable that he was going to have to fight. For an ambitious opportunist, this was not the time to wait and see what happened. The immediate cause of the war, therefore, was not the actual death of Nicomedes and Roman takeover in Bithynia, but rather the prospect of these events, which offered Mithridates the opportunity he was waiting for and prompted him to seek help from Sertorius. End quote. Anyway, Sertorius has been the leading power in Iberia, that's modern-day Spain and Portugal, by the way, for several years. And in fact, he will never be decisively defeated on the battlefield. Unfortunately for Mithridates, Sertorius is assassinated by a political rival shortly after their alliance is formalized. As in... Mithridates launches his invasion of Bithynia, and he has a messenger on a ship crossing the Mediterranean to tell Sertorius, okay, I'm attacking the Romans right now, and when the messenger arrives in Spain, Sertorius is dead, which means Rome is no longer facing a major distraction on the Iberian Peninsula. Unfortunately for just about everybody involved, 
Rome is instead facing a new distraction on the Italian peninsula. While all of this has been going on with Sertorius in the west and Mithridates in the east, the Roman Republic has been creating a major enemy in the heart of Italy itself. Remember, Rome is in the middle of a couple of centuries of rapid expansion, and everywhere the Roman legions go, along with gold and other valuables, they take slaves. When they conquer a territory by war, they'll often round up all the able-bodied people and ship them back to Italy to perform what people today would euphemistically call unpaid labor. When the Romans conquer a territory by treaty or diplomacy, they'll still take slaves, not by enslaving the local populace, but by seizing the slaves belonging to that populace, and those people too get shipped back to Italy or somewhere else nearer to the heart of the Republic, where they work as slaves for the benefit of Roman citizens. It's impossible to give an exact figure for the number of slaves in the Roman Republic, but the numbers I've seen range from about 20% up to about 30% of the population, and pretty much everybody agrees that the percentage is higher the closer to Rome you get. So, in Italy, something like one out of four or one out of three people is a slave in the first century B.C., that's a lot of slaves. And as you might expect, those people don't really want to be slaves, and from time to time there is a revolt. Historians call these revolts the Servile Wars, and in 73 BC, Rome experiences the outbreak of the Third Servile War, a rebellion launched by a guy you may have heard of. His name is Spartacus. Spartacus is a gladiator, trained to fight other gladiators in the arena, and a bunch of those gladiators get together and decide they'd rather fight the Romans than fight each other, and that's exactly what they do. And very quickly, they're joined by more gladiators and other slaves, and there are tens of thousands of them rampaging through Italy. This is a five-alarm fire for the Roman Republic. And during this little time window, most Roman leaders simply can't be bothered with events in the Far East. When Mithridates attacks, he catches the Romans completely by surprise. The Roman regional governor, who is also one of Rome's two consuls for the year, a guy named Marcus Aurelius Cotta, first learns of the invasion when the Pontic army crosses the frontier, and he calls for aid from Rome. From the sound of things, Cotta is only able to muster a small local force, most of them naval troops rather than proper legionaries. Rome has dispatched our old friend Lucullus, Sulla's former lieutenant, to reinforce their Asian province with one legion. He's also to take command of the old Fimbrian legions, but when Lucullus arrives in Anatolia, he finds that those formerly rebellious legions have been partying when they should have been drilling, and he has to spend some time whipping them back into shape. At this point, our sources once again diverge. Appian tells us that Mithridates leads his army on a lightning march across Bithynia that Marcus Aurelius Cotta withdraws as far as he can to the city of Chalcedon, and he has one of his lieutenants defend the city, which Mithridates' army ultimately surrounds and put under siege. Plutarch tells us that Marcus Aurelius Cotta is a glory hound who doesn't want Lucullus to get credit for beating Mithridates in the field, so he marches out with his totally inadequate army and they get slaughtered. But both ancient historians agree that Mithridates ends up leaving a small force to besiege the city of Chalcedon with what's left of Cotta's army inside it, and he takes the main Pontic army to besiege the nearby city of Cyzicus, which occupies a strategically important location on the south coast of the Sea of Marmara. 
Sisychus is the last major Roman stronghold in all of Anatolia. If Mithridates can force the city to surrender, he will control all the important fortifications in the area, but his strategy is risky. Far from home, his army is unable to protect the Pontic heartland should the Romans attack it. Perhaps it would be wiser to attack Lucullus's army directly, then deal with the Roman-held fortified cities. In fact, Lucullus's officers advise him to let Mithridates sit outside Sisychus, not to bother relieving Marcus Aurelius Cotta at Chalcedon either, and just to march his legions into Pontus and pillage Mithridates' homeland. This would probably be the most sensible strategy, and Mithridates' old general Archelaus, who is now acting as an advisor for Lucullus, tells him that he can just sail his fleet around Anatolia, burn the city of Sinope to the ground, and the war will be over. But Lucullus is a rare breed. He really believes in the old Roman military virtues, and according to Plutarch, he says he won't let a wild beast run free while he stalks an empty lair. So he marches his legions to Sisychus to relieve the Roman garrison. One way or another, Mithridates is now going to have to deal with Lucullus's army. When Lucullus' army arrives near Sisychus, he's dismayed at the size and quality of Mithridates' army, and he realizes that with the force at his disposal, it would be suicidal to face them in open battle. Instead, he keeps his force at a distance and tries to gather intelligence. In Parallel Lives, Plutarch writes, quote, Lucullus, feeling sure that no human provision or wealth could maintain for any length of time and in the face of an enemy so many thousands of men as Mithridates had, ordered one of the captives to be brought to him, and asked him first how many men shared his mess, and then how much food he had left in his tent. When the man had answered these questions, he ordered him to be removed, and questioned a second and a third in like manner. Then, comparing the amount of food provided with the number of men in the field, he concluded that within three or four days, the enemy's provisions would fail them. End quote. On Mithridates' side, the Roman sources are a bit vague, but they hint that some of his advisors are Romans who had been sent by Sertorius as military advisors, and they imply that now that Sertorius is dead, these Romans need to get in the good graces of people with real power in the Republic. Otherwise, they can forget about ever going back. So Mithridates' Roman advisors lie to him and tell him the supply situation is just fine. And in the meantime, Lucullus' army has occupied a hill where they can cut off the Pontic army's supply line. So this Mithridatic army that's dependent on near-daily deliveries of food is suddenly cut off from supply by land. The only viable route of supply is now by sea, which reduces the army's logistical capacity. Mithridates is forced to send his cavalry away to reduce the number of hungry mouths, and his officers likely have to reduce the men's rations. The clock is now ticking. Sooner or later, the Pontic army will no longer be able to stand up to a serious fight. Mithridates tries to take Sisychus by fear. He marches out 3,000 of the city's prisoners and says he will kill them if the Sisychans don't surrender. The Sisychan general simply responds that since those men are prisoners, their lives are no longer his responsibility, and Mithridates can do with them what he wants. Then Mithridates tries attacking by sea, and Appian tells us that he has this enormous ship-mounted siege tower that actually gets up to the city walls, and some of the Pontic soldiers get across and break a hole in the wall and occupy some of the ramparts. 
But then a large wave comes and wrecks the giant siege tower, and Mithridates can't reinforce his men on the walls, and the Sisykans are able to retake them and patch up the hole. As the winter sets in, the sea freezes over, and the Pontic army is completely cut off from supply. Appian writes, quote, His whole army suffered from hunger, and many of them died. There were some who ate the entrails according to a barbarian custom. Others were made sick by subsisting on herbs. Moreover, the corpses that were thrown out in the neighborhood unburied brought on a plague in addition to that caused by famine. End quote. With his army's morale and manpower on the wane, Mithridates makes one last effort to take the city of Sisychus. There's a nearby mountain with what Appian says are large mounds extending towards the city walls, and Mithridates deploys his men across the mounds and tries to push siege towers along the mounds to get over the walls. But the Sisykans dig tunnels underneath the mounds and collapse them, destroying the siege engines and foiling Mithridates' efforts once and for all. He divides his army in two, and while his half of the army escapes more or less unscathed, Lucullus pursues the other group of men and slaughters what Appian calls a great many while they're trying to cross a river. Plutarch says that Mithridates loses 300,000 men during the campaign. That's highly unlikely since earlier in his own text, Plutarch writes that Mithridates took a total of 136,000 men on campaign to begin with, and even that number is probably an exaggeration. But certainly Mithridates did not lose more than 200% of his army during a single river crossing. When Appian says a great many, it nonetheless certainly means many thousands of men. Mithridates retreats by boat to Pontus, losing 10,000 more men in a storm along the way. And back in Pontus, he goes to a town called Kabira, makes it his headquarters, and cobbles together another land army. While Mithridates prepares for yet another showdown, Lucullus fights his way across Anatolia by land. As is common in this time and place, many of the local city-states have no desire to fight and surrender to the Romans just as they had surrendered to Mithridates before them and before Mithridates to Alexander the Great and Darius the Great and so many other conquerors. A few of the cities remain loyal and try to hold out, so Lucullus leaves besieging forces at those cities and keeps chasing Mithridates with his main army. Appian gives us a sense for how vicious siege warfare can be in this era. Quote, with another army, Lucullus besieged Themyscira, which is named after one of the Amazons and is situated on the river Thermodon. The besiegers of this place brought up towers, built mounds, and dug tunnels so large that great subterranean battles could be fought in them. The inhabitants cut openings into these tunnels from above, and thrust bears and other wild animals and swarms of bees into them against the workers. End quote. At one city, a place called Amesis, Lucullus's men are about to break through the walls, and everyone knows it's the end. So rather than let the Romans loot their city, the citizens burn it to the ground and run away. As the legionaries rush into the city, Lucullus tries to keep discipline and organized firefighting brigades to save Amesis's art and architecture. But the men immediately break discipline and try to loot what they can before it all burns up. And Lucullus, who's something of a humanitarian, supposedly weeps for the city's fate. Later in his career, he will make a point of rebuilding Emesis. 
Eventually, Lucullus does catch up with Mithridates, and he sends his cavalry over a mountain pass into Kibera to get the lay of the land. Mithridates sends out his superior cavalry force and drives them back. It's a victory of sorts, but the Pontic army never engages with the Roman infantry, and Lucullus is able to form his men up on a mountain where he poses a constant threat and makes it hard for Mithridates to gather more reinforcements. During this uneasy standoff, we get another of those interesting cases where two of our sources give us two different versions of a story. In this case, there's going to be an attempt on Lucullus's life, and our Roman historians can't seem to agree on who is responsible. In Parallel Lives, Plutarch tells us about a certain barbarian prince who's friends with Mithridates, quote, in the camp of Mithridates, there was a Dandarian prince named Olthacus, a man conspicuous as a soldier for qualities of strength and boldness, of a most excellent judgment, and with all affable and address and of insinuating manners. This man was always an emulous rivalry for the precedence with a fellow prince of his tribe, and so was led to undertake a great exploit for Mithridates, namely the murder of Lucullus. The king approved his design, and purposely inflicted upon him sundry marks of disgrace, whereupon, pretending to be enraged, he galloped off to Lucullus, who gladly welcomed him, since there was much talk of him in the camp. After a short probation, Lucullus was so pleased with his shrewdness and zeal that he made him a table companion, and at last a member of his council. Now when the Dandarian thought his opportunity had come, he ordered his slaves to lead his horse outside the camp, while he himself, at midday, when the soldiers were lying around enjoying their rest, went to the general's tent. He thought no one would deny entrance to a man who was an intimate of the general, and said he brought him certain messages of great importance. And he would have entered without let or hindrance, had not sleep, the destroyer of many generals, saved Lucullus for it chanced that he was asleep. And Menedemus, one of his chamberlains, who stood at the tent door, told Olthacus that he had come at an inopportune time, since Lucullus had just betaken himself to rest after his long watching and many hardships. Olthacus did not retire at the bidding of Mendamus, but declared that even in spite of him he would go in, since he wished to confer with the general on urgent business of great importance. Then Mendamus got angry, declared that nothing was more urgent than the preservation of Lucullus, and pushed the man away with both hands. Then Olthacus, in fear, left the camp, took horse, and rode off to the camp of Mithridates without effecting his purpose. End quote. Appian gives us a totally different version of the story. According to him, Olthacus isn't a double agent at all. He's a barbarian who works with Lucullus and has bravely fought in battle and earned a place among the senior Roman officers. He only goes over to Mithridates after he's almost caught. And Appian even adds that as a sign he's switching sides for real, Olthacus gives Mithridates the name of another barbarian leader who's working as a double agent for Lucullus. This whole year or so of the war is like that, with both of our major sources disagreeing on fairly significant points, and it's very confusing to read about, so here's the gist of it. This time, the Romans are an unfriendly territory instead of vice versa, and like Mithridates had been at Cyzicus, Lucullus is dependent on a single supply line. He is stuck on his mountain, and Mithridates occupies the plain around that mountain, which he can dominate with his superior cavalry. Mithridates doesn't need to fight a huge battle with Lucullus's main army. He just needs to starve him out, but this is easier said than done. Philip Matizak writes, quote, At Cyzicus, 
Mithridates had been taught that a strong position with poor supply lines was at least as bad as a poor position with good supply lines, and he was determined to give Lucullus the benefit of this lesson. The Pontic cavalry made a violent attack on a supply convoy which was bringing corn from Cappadocia. The convoy had an escort of ten cohorts of infantry, commanded by one Sornatius, and these succeeded in holding off the attack. So Mithridates decided that the next attempt by the Pontics would constitute a mixed force of infantry and cavalry. Some 4,000 infantry and the Pontic cavalry fell upon the next Roman supply convoy, but possibly due to poor coordination between foot and horse, the battle took place in the narrow valley where the horsemen were almost unable to deploy. The infantry and half the Pontic cavalry were wiped out. The infantry were not a serious loss, but with his cavalry crippled, Mithridates was unable to dominate the plain. Almost certainly, as soon as Lucullus comprehended this, he would descend from his hill and either force the Pontic infantry to battle on the plain or, if battle was declined, lay siege to the Pontic camp. Mithridates, Harboring no illusions as to what would happen to his foot soldiers if the Fimbrians got to grips with them, made ready to withdraw. End quote. Now, the defeat at Kabira isn't a war ending thing. All Mithridates has to do is withdraw and regroup to fight another day. So he orders his personal retinue to start packing up but he delays giving any such order to the rest of his troops. This is most likely just a failure in communication. Mithridates isn't going anywhere without his army, and it's not like there's some urgent reason to run away with all due speed. Lucullus's troops are up on their mountain. They're not charging down onto the plain to attack right now. Unfortunately, when Mithridates' men see his own attendants packing up, they assume that the day's defeat must have been a total disaster, and some of them start to panic. And panic is contagious, so soon more and more men start packing up and fleeing, and some don't even bother packing, they just start running. There's no order, no moving out by groups, just guys running in every direction. When Roman scouts see this, they report the news to Lucullus, who immediately orders an attack. Now there really is an emergency, and the fleeing, scattering men are about to get slaughtered. Mithridates' childhood companion, Dorilaus, walks into the mass of troops and tries to restore order. But he's not dealing with an army anymore. He's dealing with a mob. A few of the men jump him, stab him to death, and steal his valuable purple cloak before running off and getting lost in the crowd. The confusion is so bad that Mithridates himself gets swept away with a bunch of foot soldiers and separated from his retinue. But thankfully one of his servants, a eunuch, spots him and rides into the mob to bring him a horse. As the Roman army sweeps in, they start cutting down fleeing men left and right. A sharp-eyed Roman cavalry commander spots Mithridates and his retinue running away on horseback, and he leads his men through the crowd in an attempt to capture the Pontic king. The Roman cavalry actually come within a few feet of Mithridates, but in this cinematic moment, either the king or someone in his retinue cuts the strap on a saddlebag of one of the Pontic pack horses, and when the bag falls, it's full of gold coins that scatter all over the place, and the Roman soldiers stop to collect the coins, and Mithridates gets away. This almost sounds like a fabrication. Maybe a story the writer made up as some kind of parable about eastern opulence and the dangers of greed, but it's one of the few elements of the story that Appian and Plutarch both actually agree on. Regardless, Mithridates is now badly beaten. Instead of leading his army in an ordered retreat, he's leading a small retinue of close, loyal supporters on the run from the Romans. 
and there's no time to build a new army. Anatolia has been overrun, and the king of Pontus is going to have to go into exile. Searching for some kind of sanctuary, Mithridates appeals to his son Macaris, who is the king of the Bosporan kingdom in modern-day Crimea. Instead of helping his father, Macaris sends a golden crown to Lucullus. The message is clear. The Bosporan kingdom would rather bend the knee to Rome and live in peace than bend the knee to Mithridates and go to war. In his mad dash into exile, Mithridates does not forget about his family. Remember his younger sisters, who were all locked in a tower to prevent them from having any children that might threaten his rule? They're still there, 50 years later, along with a handful of former concubines and Moname, the wealthy Greek woman he had married once upon a time. Mithridates has no way to protect these women from the Romans, who will no doubt do terrible things to them if they're captured, or use them against Mithridates in some way, so he sends a eunuch named Bacchides to take care of them. And by take care of them, I mean exactly what you probably think I mean. Plutarch tells us that Bacchides offers each of the women a choice in how they're going to die. Some choose poison, some have their throats cut, and some are strangled. And it's tough to get inside someone's head at a time like this, although Plutarch does describe how some of the women react. Moname, with all her upper-class Greek dignity, chooses to hang herself with a necklace Mithridates had given her. This is a special necklace that's just for the queen to wear, and when Moname tries to hang herself with it, the necklace breaks, and according to Plutarch, she says, You cursed bauble! You have never been of any use to me, not even for hanging. And then Plutarch says she offered her throat to Bacchides. Mithridates' sister Roxana dies cursing her brother, while Statira peacefully drinks her poison while asking Bacchides to thank her brother for sparing her from death or worse at the hands of the Romans. And it's not just Mithridates' sisters and concubines that are killed, but also apparently some other family members. Plutarch writes about one concubine, Berenice, who shares her dose of poison with her mother. And then, when the half-dose of poison kills her mother and not her, Bacchides strangles her to death. With his sisters and concubines dead, Mithridates is eventually able to find sanctuary. His son-in-law, King Tigranes of Armenia, does not consider himself an enemy of the Romans, but he also thinks of himself as the emperor of a great land and Tigranes is not going to refuse sanctuary to his father-in-law just because it might make a bunch of Romans angry, so he welcomes Mithridates into his country. That said, Tigranes also has no interest in going to war with the Romans, while Mithridates clearly sees his time in Armenia as an opportunity to once again rebuild his power base probably to avoid getting dragged into the conflict between Mithridates and the Romans, King Tigranes keeps his father-in-law at a distance. For three years, Mithridates is treated as an honored guest and is housed in lavish apartments, but Tigranes never once meets with him one-on-one. -on -one. All the while, the Romans are slowly digesting Anatolia, taking slaves, installing governors and tax collectors, and transforming the Anatolian East into a mirror image of the Iberian West. Not a land of free and independent people, but the frontier of an all-consuming empire built on a foundation of Roman greed and corruption. Mithridates may have been removed from power, but as long as he lives, there's always the chance that he might return one day to retake his throne. 
So Lucullus sends an ambassador to King Tigranes of Armenia to demand that he hand Mithridates over to the Romans for judgment. This ambassador is a guy named Appius Claudius Pulcher, and if you're a big fan of Roman history, you may be familiar with his younger siblings, Clodius and Clodia, who will both play significant roles in the fall of the Roman Republic just a few years from now. Well, Appius Claudius Pulcher doesn't know the first thing about Armenia, which at this time is a burgeoning empire of its own, including not just modern-day Armenia, but large swaths of the Middle East and Far Eastern Anatolia. King Tigranes knows this, so rather than deal with the Roman ambassador, he just has his men lead Pulcher around in circles in the desert, hoping that the Roman will have no idea what's going on and eventually he'll just give up. But Pulcher has an ace up his sleeve. A local slave who knows the land, and informs him that he's being led around in circles. So he ditches his Armenian guides and lets this slave take him to the city of Antioch, where he's told to wait for a little bit for King Tigranes, who is busy putting down a nearby rebellion. This works just fine for Pulcher, who spends his time chatting with some of the local lesser kings, many of whom are resentful of Tigranes' power. Plutarch writes of Pulcher's time with these kings, quote, He gained over many of the princes who paid but a hollow obedience to the Armenian. One of these was Zarbienus, king of Gordien. He also promised many of the enslaved cities when they sent to confer with him secretly the assistance of Lucullus, although for the present he bade them keep quiet. Now the sway of the Armenians was intolerably grievous to the Greeks. Above all else, the spirit of the king himself had become pompous and haughty in the midst of his great prosperity. All the things which men most covet and admire, he not only had in his possession, but actually thought that they existed for his sake. For though he had started on his career with small and insignificant expectations, he had subdued many nations, humbled the Parthian power as no man before him had done, and filled Mesopotamia with Greeks whom he removed in great numbers from Cilicia and from Cappadocia, and settled anew. He also removed from their wanted haunts the nomadic Arabians, and brought them to an adjacent settlement that he might employ them in trade and commerce. Many were the kings who waited upon him, and four, whom he always had about him like attendants or bodyguards, would run on foot by their master's side when he rode out, clad in short blouses, and when he sat transacting business, would stand by with their arms crossed. This attitude was thought to be the plainest confession of servitude, as if they had sold their freedom and offered their persons to their master disposed for suffering rather than for service. End quote. After talking with some of these kings and getting the impression that Tigranes isn't very popular, Pulcher finally gets to meet with Tigranes himself. But as Plutarch says, Tigranes has grown arrogant in his power. The guy has even started calling himself by the old Persian imperial title, King of Kings. So as Pulcher speaks, Tigranes smiles and yawns and does his best not to look insulted when the Roman ambassador fails to refer to him as King of Kings and tells him that he has two choices. Hand over Mithridates for judgment, or Rome will declare war on Armenia. Tigranes refuses, Pulcher returns to Lucullus, and Lucullus launches an invasion of Armenia. Now, Tigranes had apparently believed the Roman threat of invasion to be a bluff, and he is caught by surprise when a messenger arrives from the frontier telling him that Lucullus has invaded with two legions and 500 cavalry. In fact, Tigranes is so surprised that he has the messenger hanged, believing that the man is just a disturber of the peace, trying to create panic. 
This creates a shoot-the-messenger effect that's happened more than once in history. Since Tigranes might execute anyone who gives him an update on the Roman invasion, nobody gives him an update, and Lucullus just keeps advancing further and further into Armenia without any kind of response from the government. By the time Tigranes orders a response, Lucullus has brought three more legions into Armenia. That's a total of five legions, plus cavalry and a handful of auxiliary units like slingers, bringing the Roman troop total to approximately 30,000 infantry and a little over 1,500 cavalry. This force smashes through a 3,000-man cavalry force Tigranes had sent out to meet it and advances towards the city of Tigranocerta, near the city of Diyarbakir in the southeast of modern-day Turkey. Now, Tigranocerta isn't just any city. See, Tigranes is himself a great conqueror, and after conquering this region early in his reign, he had built a big new fancy capital city and named it after himself, hence Tigranocerta or Tigranes City. So Lucullus is attacking not just the Armenian capital, but a city that represents the king of kings personally, and all he has accomplished. At this point, Mithridates, who is living off on one of the royal estates, sends a series of letters and messengers to Tigranes, warning him not to attack the Romans directly. Instead, he and several of Tigranes' advisors urge the king of kings to allow the Romans to besiege Tigranocerta and to march out with just his cavalry to do an end run around Lucullus, cut off the Roman supply lines, and starve the legions out. At first, Tigranes is amenable to this. After all, it's a sensible strategy. But two things make him change his mind. One is something Tigranes has known all along. Being a brand new city, Tigranocerta had needed people to live in it, so when he had founded his new capital, Tigranes had forcibly relocated a bunch of people from around his empire to populate it. As you might expect, this upset most of the people, and Tigranes is concerned, not without good reason, that Tigranocerta's own citizens might rise up against the city's garrison and let the Romans in. After all, if they do this, there is a chance Lucullus might let them go home. But Tigranes also gathers a massive army from all over his empire and from allied lands. And it's this ability to raise a massive army that convinces him to march out and fight Lucullus. Plutarch writes, quote, When the Armenians and Gordiani joined him with all their hosts, and the kings of the Medes and Adiabini came up with all their hosts, and many Arabs arrived from the Sea of Babylonia, and many Albanians from the Caspian Sea, together with Iberians who were neighbors to the Albanians, and when not a few of the peoples about the river Araxes who were not subject to kings had been induced by favors and gifts to come and join him, and when the banquets of the king and his councils as well were full of hopes and great boldness and barbaric threats, then Mithridates was thought to be diverting the king from a great success out of mere envy. End quote. Plutarch goes on to tell us that the Armenian army has over 200,000 troops, and Appian puts this number at 300,000. That's four to six times the numbers of the Roman force, although again we have to account for some exaggeration. But even if Tigranes' army only outnumbers the Romans three or four to one, that's still a huge advantage on paper. When his army sets up camp near Tigranocerta, and the king of king looks out over the plain and sees Lucullus's Roman army, he jokes that there are too many of them to be a diplomatic mission, but too few to be going to war. Mithridates has seen this movie before. 
On the one side is a Greco-Persian style army with all kinds of fancy uniforms and gobs and gobs of soldiers who look great in a parade. On the other side is a small force of Romans with more subdued uniforms who don't look terribly impressive. But those Romans are hard, disciplined fighters with years of extensive training and drilling. The battle does not go well for Tigranes, who's surprised to wake up the next morning and see Lucullus's army marching towards his men. He deploys his force in the standard formation for eastern armies, with his infantry to the front and his cavalry out to the sides to catch the enemy in a pincher. It's that old hammer and anvil tactic all over again, and it almost works. As Lucullus's men approach, he first orders them to advance on the run, so they spend as little time as possible getting pelted by Armenian arrows before they come to grips with the infantry. Of course, that's exactly what Tigranes wants him to do, but then Lucullus notices the cavalry off to the sides, and he deploys his own cavalry to hold them off. The Roman cavalry is far less numerous than their Armenian counterparts, but that's fine because this is really just a diversion to keep those Armenian cavalry busy. Lucullus then pulls his infantry back as if they're retreating, and many of the Armenian troops and their allies break ranks to chase after them. But the Romans aren't retreating. They march around the side of a hill, ford a small river, and go way out around the side of Tigranes' army and charge down the mountain into the flanks of the Armenian cavalry, who are busy fighting off the Roman cavalry and get caught completely by surprise. These men panic and run towards the safety of the Armenian infantry in the center, and once again the sheer size of one of these massive eastern armies works against it because the running cavalry have nowhere to go without smashing directly into the infantry, those of whom haven't already broken ranks and charged off in different directions. So, all of a sudden, Tigranes' men are trapped in a confused melee and fighting each other instead of the Romans. Those who haven't already broken ranks begin to run away, and the king of kings himself has to hurriedly pack up his tent and retreat northwards. Having learned his lesson, Tigranes then goes to Mithridates and asks him to lead an army against the Romans. Mithridates gives Tigranes his own royal robe as a sign of good faith, and swears to restore the king of kings to his throne. Then he builds yet another new army, this one even smaller and more thoroughly trained than ever. From deep in the mountains of eastern Anatolia, they call for men from all over Tigranes' lands. Appian tells us that Mithridates recruits only 70,000 infantry and 35,000 cavalry, choosing the very fittest men, and he sends the rest home. In the next summer, in 68 BC, the two sides go at it again, this time near the city of Artaxata which Lucullus is trying to take over. Tigranes and Mithridates try to attack his legions and drive them off, and they're pushed back to the city. Lucullus, on the other hand, is unable to actually force his way into the city and make it surrender, and he eventually has to fall back and make a secure camp for the winter, so the campaign season is more or less a stalemate. Lucullus does, however, take another small city, a place called Nisibis, during the winter, but the city is virtually undefended, and neither Tigranes nor Mithridates considers it strategically important enough to send help. Even given the stalemate of 68 BC, you might expect Lucullus to be more popular than ever with his fellow Romans after his huge victory at Tigranocertes the year before. But Roman politics come into play once more. There are a couple of things working against Lucullus here. For one thing, he's not very popular with his legions. 
Being an old school, honorable Roman aristocrat, he's out of touch with the rank and file legionaries who are in this war for the pay and are sick of camping in the open field instead of either looting enemy cities or enjoying the luxuries of friendly cities. The old Fimbrian legions, in particular, refuse to fight any longer, and Lucullus is unable to convince them otherwise. They only agree to remain in camp when soldiers from some other legions ask them to stay, and even then, they only agree to remain in the field through the next summer. Unfortunately for Lucullus, he now lacks the legal authority to force anyone to do anything. See, his invasion of Armenia had never been approved by the Senate, and the Senate doesn't like people declaring war without their approval. So Lucullus is actually removed from his position, and the command of the Roman armies in the east is given to a guy named Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus. Pompey the Great. This is a man who will go on to become the second most famous Roman of the century, and in most centuries he would probably be the most famous Roman. It just so happens that in the first century BC he's contending with Julius Caesar. And without Pompey's help, you probably never get Caesar to begin with. At this time, Pompey is 38 years old. He comes from one of the newest noble families. In fact, his father had been the first member of the family to become a senator. And he's ambitious and hungry for glory. He has served with distinction under Sulla and helped fight Sertorius's rebels and led a successful naval campaign to eradicate pirates from the Mediterranean. He has even served a term as consul, which is impressive for a man under 40. This glory-hungry character trait also comes with a downside. Pompey is eager to take credit for any Roman successes whether he really had anything to do with them or not. Uh, for example, after another guy you may have heard of, Marcus Licinius Crassus, puts down Spartacus's rebellion, Pompey had captured a few thousand fleeing stragglers, and he has them crucified along a public highway, publicly proclaiming that he killed the last of the rebels. Now he does the same thing to Lucullus, basically trying to make it as if Lucullus has done nothing swiftly shuffling the other man aside, refusing to take his advice, and countermanding any order Lucullus tries to give. With the Romans temporarily in disarray, Mithridates senses an opportunity to strike back, and he does in 67 BC while Lucullus is still in command. Using a small force of fast cavalry, Mithridates leaves Armenia altogether and marches into Pontus, catching the local Roman troops completely by surprise. In this campaign, he leads his army personally and shows an impressive amount of vigor for a guy who's now 68 years old. While leading from the front in one of the earlier battles, a bullet from a sling slams into his knee while an arrow strikes next to his eye threatening to blind him on one side. Thankfully, Mithridates' obsession with pharmacology pays off, and his Scythian healers are able to preserve his eyesight with a concoction made from snake venom. Shortly thereafter, in another battle, a Roman double agent who has joined Mithridates' army gets close enough to slash him with his sword during a cavalry charge. He strikes the king's unarmored thigh, and Mithridates has to be hauled back to his tent to have the wound treated. At the sight of their king being carried off the field, a rumor starts going around amongst the troops that Mithridates is dead, and some of his friends actually have to hold him up over their heads to show everybody that he's still alive. This is yet another parallel to Alexander the Great, who had something similar happen to him in India, and Appian even makes that comparison explicitly in his text. This battle, the Battle of Zella, is fought not far from the Pontic capital of Sinope. The Romans attack Mithridates' men during a dark, rainy night, 
but he leads a furious countercharge at the head of his own horsemen. Even after their king is wounded and carried from the field, the Pontic cavalry drive the Romans back to the trenches around their camp, which have filled with rainwater and many of the legionaries drown. The next morning, Mithridates' men return to the Roman camp to finish the job, but they find only 7,000 corpses. Every Roman left alive has run away during the night. Appian tells us that among the 7,000 corpses are 24 tribunes and 150 centurions, the highest number of Roman officers ever lost in an ancient battle. It's worth noting that these men are from the Fimbrian legions, which are now more or less finished as a fighting force. Anyway, Mithridates' Blitzkrieg campaign is incredibly successful, and by the end of 67 BC, he's driven the Romans entirely out of Pontus, and against all odds is once again in full command of his kingdom. Back in Armenia, Tigranes is still in command of his own army. Despite the Romans' best efforts, they seem to be losing this war. But Pompey aims to change that. Shortly after the Roman defeat at Zella, he personally takes command of the Eastern legions and prepares for a counterattack against Mithridates. Unfortunately, the legions are in no shape to fight, and it's going to take Pompey a full year to rebuild them to their full strength, and also to make some administrative changes to the regional government that I'm not going to get into. The point is, both sides have a full year to prepare for the next campaign, and while Mithridates does gather more men and gold from his capital in Sinope, he never and truly intends to make a stand there against Pompey's army. In fact, he doesn't seem to want to fight at all at this point. He sends a diplomat to the Romans to ask for peace terms, but Pompey's terms are unacceptable. Surrender all Roman deserters who have joined the Pontic army, which is a large number of men, and surrender the kingdom of Pontus itself unconditionally. In other words, even if he surrenders and lets Pompey march into his kingdom, Mithridates faces exile at best and a humiliating death at worst. Never mind the fact that Pompey would certainly execute any Roman deserters returned to him. This is no peace offer. This is merely confirmation that Mithridates has no real choice but to fight to the end. With his efforts to make peace thwarted, Mithridates prepares for a strategic retreat. Now, you kind of have to read between the lines because the ancient historians don't make this very clear. None of these surviving sources are pro-Mithridates. At best, they're neutral, and most of them try to present him as a villain, and bias creeps in, and they make it sound like he runs in terror from Pompey's army. But it does seem like Mithridates is going to withdraw from Pontus intentionally, to draw Pompey further east, extend his supply lines, and eventually force the Romans to fight himself and Tigranes together at the end of a long supply line deep in enemy territory. Appian tells us that Mithridates engages in scorched earth tactics, taking whatever food he can with his army and burning remaining crops to the ground. As the food runs out, his men even slaughter the pack animals, both ensuring that nothing is wasted and making the army less cumbersome the further east it runs. At one point along his march, Mithridates passes through the land of a people called the Turret Folk, who live in tree houses in the Anatolian wilderness. These Turret Folk aren't part of any empire or kingdom and are known for attacking anyone who marches through their land. Yet, Mithridates' army passes unmolested. When Pompey's army follows behind, the turret folk leave out bowls filled with toxic honey made from rhododendron flowers. 
Strabo writes that Pompey's scouts find the honey and eat it. And when they fall asleep, the turret folk slaughter three maniples of them, which in this time period is a little under 500 men. This incident raises all kinds of questions. Were the turret folk working with Mithridates? Did he perhaps make friends with them during his adventures as a young man and later call on them for help? Or did the turret folk simply not bother trying the poisoned honey trick on Pontic troops who would know better than to eat conveniently placed bowls of honey in a forest full of xenophobic tribesmen? We'll never know. Despite Mithridates making every effort to put distance between himself and Pompey, Pompey impresses him yet again, this time by demonstrating just how quickly a Roman legion can move and still protect its supply lines. Every night, Pompey's men build a little fort, and as they advance, they leave a series of these little forts behind them providing plenty of protection for supplies that have been shipped over from the Mediterranean. Not only that, but Pompey's army is actually gaining on Mithridates. That's not good. If Mithridates is going to fight the Romans successfully, he needs to get back to Armenia and link up with Tigranes, and Pompey is not cooperating. Eventually, the Romans get close enough that the advance Roman cavalry starts skirmishing with Mithridates' rearguard in the evenings. On one such evening, Pompey gets the rest of his cavalry close enough to charge into Mithridates' rearguard, forcing them to retreat. This causes some panic among the rest of Mithridates' troops, who have already made camp for the evening. Mithridates prepares to make an escape in the early morning, but at the urging of some of his advisors, Pompey attacks by moonlight. To understand what happens next, you have to understand a little bit about what happens when Roman and Greco-Persian troops get into battle. See, Mithridates' troops aren't as heavily armed or armored as the Roman legionaries, and even though he's chosen the best and strongest men he could find, his armies lack the generations of institutional experience that the Roman armies have in fighting in the legionary style. Mithridates' men rely heavily on bows and javelins to cut down the legionaries at a distance, which will demoralize them and break up their formations before the two armies come to blows. When Pompey's men attack in the moonlight, with the moon at their backs casting long shadows over the Pontic troops, it's impossible for Mithridates' men to accurately gauge their distance. Their arrows and javelins are falling short or going right over the Romans' heads as they move in for the kill. Cassius Dio says that some of Mithridates' spearmen stab at the air in front of them, thinking there's a legionary close enough to hit, while other Pontic soldiers make no move to defend themselves when a Roman stabs out with his sword because they can't see how close he is. With the Romans closing in on all sides, Mithridates realizes his army has lost. He gathers 800 horsemen and leads them at a specific spot in the Roman lines, which allows them to break through. Although many of these horsemen are killed and more are chased down and killed later on by Roman cavalry. By the end of the night, Mithridates is left with three companions. One of these is Hypsicratea, his warrior bride who cares for his horses and goes with him everywhere. Valerius Maximus writes, quote, After he was defeated by Pompey, she followed him with an indefatigable body and spirit in his flight through many rough and barbarous nations. Her faithful company was a great comfort and solace for Mithridates when he was distressed by misfortunes and calamities for he seemed to have his home and family together with him wherever he wandered, while his wife shared in his exile. End quote. Mithridates and his companions ride to a place called Sonora, 
where he seems to have a few other friends waiting as well as a stash of gold. He distributes the gold amongst his friends in case they get separated on the road and also gives them each another gift. A dram of poison to wear around their neck in case they get captured. Much like the amulet Mithridates himself has worn for decades. A dram is about a teaspoon, so we're not talking about some large flask, just a tiny dose of poison in pill form that's designed to be mixed with liquid. Just enough to do the job. Mithridates and his companions next try to run back to Armenia to continue the fight, but Tigranes is nothing but a pragmatist. He's done all that is reasonable to protect his father-in-law, and he's already lost a bunch of his own territory, including Syria, to Lucullus. When Pompey approaches with his army, the king of kings and his son, also named Tigranes, ride out to meet him. When they arrive at the camp, a couple of senior officers come out and order them to dismount, because nobody rides a horse in a Roman camp. So Tigranes gets off his horse and walks to Pompey's tent, and he lays his crown at his feet and takes off his purple royal robe and lays that at his feet, and remember, Tigranes had used to have four lesser kings run along on foot while he rode his horse, so this act of submission shows just how far he's fallen. And then he goes to kneel in front of Pompey, but Pompey grabs him by the shoulders and tells him to have a seat. Then he tells him that, Rome has no designs on Armenia, and that while the Republic will be keeping Syria and the other lands that Lucullus had conquered, they're not going to ask for any more peace concessions other than a small amount of war reparations. Tigranes agrees to this, but the young Tigranes, his heir, stands up and says that he won't have his kingdom granted to him by some Roman. So Pompey has the young Tigranes arrested and takes him back to Rome to be displayed in his triumph, which is a big parade you get to throw if you're a successful Roman general. Although it does sound like the young Tigranes gets to go home to his father's palace after the triumph. This humiliation is just to teach him a lesson. Armenia is now to be a Roman client state in all but name a frontier zone between the Republic and the Parthian Empire to the east. As for Mithridates, Tigranes puts a significant bounty on his head, which means Armenia is no longer a safe refuge. Instead, Mithridates flees over land across the Black Sea coast, first east as far as he can go, then north through modern-day Georgia and the Caucasus Mountains. This is the land the ancient peoples call Colchis, where Jason and the Argonauts had found the Golden Fleece. With his small group of companions, Mithridates is able to outrun any Roman pursuers, and he eventually makes it to the last place he might be safe. The Bosporan Kingdom, centered on Crimea where his son Macaris continues to rule in his name, although remember that Macaris had also sent a crown to Lucullus and submitted to Rome, so it's not as if Mithridates himself can just stroll into the palace and announce that he's taking over. Pompey is well aware of this and seems to think that Mithridates is no longer a threat now that he's gone north of the Caucasus Mountains. Instead, Pompey spends some time hanging out in Colchis, which is the home of not just the Golden Fleece, but many other ancient mythological sites. This is fitting, since to ancient Mediterranean peoples, the east coast of the Black Sea might as well be the edge of the world. Appian writes, quote, Pompey pursued Mithridates in his flight as far as Colchis, but he thought that his foe would never get around to Pontus or to the Sea of Azov, or undertake anything great even if he should escape. 
He advanced to Colchis in order to gain knowledge of the country visited by the Argonauts, Castor and Pollux, and Hercules. And especially he desired to see the place where they say that Prometheus was fastened to Mount Caucasus, end quote. Pompey then engages in some military adventurism, battling some tribes near the Caspian Sea before marching back to Anatolia and the Levant to manage Roman affairs in the eastern Mediterranean. At any rate, he seems to think Mithridates is either dead or too far away to cause any trouble. And as far as the Romans are concerned, Pompey is right, but Mithridates isn't done fighting. Not quite yet. He's just not going to get to fight Romans again. On his way to the Bosporan kingdom, Mithridates passes through Scythia and once again spends time with the tribes he had wandered with in his younger years. He calls on old alliances, and when he marches into Crimea, he leads an army of horsemen. As it turns out, he doesn't even have to fight. When King Macaris sees his father coming at the head of an army, he kills himself rather than risk facing the revenge of Mithridates. When Mithridates arrives at the palace, he is instead greeted by a younger son named Pharnaces, who welcomes him to the palace. After executing some disloyal administrative staff as well as an ex-wife who had run off to live with Macaris, Mithridates once again sets out building an army. Where taxes in the Bosporan kingdom had previously been low, now he raises them to support a military capable of matching Rome. Where military service had previously been voluntary, Mithridates institutes conscription to fill his ranks. And when he feels strong enough, he sends a message to Pompey, asking to make peace and take back rulership of Pontus in exchange for paying tribute to Rome. After all, that's the deal Tigranes got. And Pompey says that he will probably accept this offer, but only if Mithridates comes and bows before him like Tigranes. This makes Mithridates nervous. He thinks it could be a trap, so he says instead he will send a couple of his sons to act as hostages for his good behavior, but Pompey says no, if you want to make peace, you have to come yourself, and this Mithridates will not do so he continues building his army. Now over 70 years old, he plans a march over land across the Black Sea coast, through the Balkans, across Germany to modern-day France to link up with the Gauls. Then he plans a crossing over the Alps and into Italy itself, where Rome has just put down Spartacus's rebellion and the city-states who had revolted not that long ago had given Rome a lot of trouble and many are still angry. If Mithridates can march into Italy with a large army, he might find enough local allies and rebellious slaves to strike Rome itself. It's an ambitious plan, probably the most ambitious military plan ever seriously suggested by someone with the power to try it in the ancient world. What Mithridates fails to realize is that his power has limits. He is no longer the ruler of all Anatolia and half the Black Sea coast. He's the ruler of a relatively poor kingdom, the Bosporan kingdom, that spent the last 25 years being more or less left to itself. And here comes Mithridates, after 25 years of being an absentee ruler, suddenly taxing people to the bone and forcing men to go to war against a Roman republic that they have no argument with. The revolt begins in a city called Phanagoria where a Greek citizen stabs one of Mithridates' eunuch administrators in a public act of protest. Mithridates has been employing more and more of these eunuchs, and they've formed an inner circle around the king so that nobody can talk to him unless they go through the eunuchs first, not even his soldiers. So the eunuchs are symbols of this distant, paranoid king, 
And this stabbing is an assault on that symbol more than on the individual eunuch. And everybody understands that. Riots break out. And people start setting fire to public buildings in Phanagoria. Mithridates dispatches troops to rescue some of his family members who are trapped in the burning city, and it's likely that Hypsocrateia dies in this rescue mission. At least there's a stone there with her epitaph carved in it, using the masculine form of her name, Hypsocrates, and referring to her as the wife of Mithridates Eupator. Rebellion by the general public is one thing, Mithridates has seen this before and he can deal with that, but the final nail in Mithridates' coffin will be the betrayal of a family member. See, his son Pharnaces is his heir, and Pharnaces knows that this idea of invading Italy is almost certainly not going to work, but will also almost certainly make the Romans very angry in the process. If Mithridates tries this, he's not going to win, but he may provoke a Roman invasion and wreck the Bosporan kingdom, the kingdom that Pharnaces wants to grow and nurture when he becomes king. So he starts plotting with some of his friends to get rid of his father and take the throne for himself. Mithridates' spies find out about Pharnaces' betrayal, and he has his son brought before him for judgment. He's about to have Pharnaces executed, but an advisor named Metrophanes convinces him that it would be bad luck to kill his own heir before going to war. Mithridates agrees and forgives Pharnaces, but Pharnaces himself can't shake the idea that his dad is going to have him killed sooner or later. So he goes to a bunch of Mithridates' troops convinces them that invading Italy is suicidally stupid and tells them that if they side with him and help him overthrow his father, he will make them all rich. The next morning, Mithridates awakens to find a mob outside his palace. According to Appian, the people are chanting, quote, We want your son to be king. We want a young man instead of an old one who is ruled by eunuchs the slayer of so many of his sons, his generals, and his friends. End quote. Mithridates goes down from his palace to try and talk to the people, but some of them start hurling objects, and others break into the royal stables and cut the throats of his favorite horses. He returns to his palace and climbs a tall tower where he watches as some people weave a crown from sacred leaves from the city's temple, and they put it on Pharnaces' head and proclaim him king. Mithridates has lost almost everyone who is loyal to him, his kingdom, his wealth, his family, and the love of his life. He's trapped in a tower with no way out except through an angry mob. All that's left now is to decide how to end things. Does he throw himself on the mercy of the mob? Even if the people spare him, Pharnaces will most likely never let him live. He can't afford to. Things have gone too far for that. Does he wait in the tower for things to change? Perhaps. But there's only so much food, and if he stays long enough in one place, Pharnaces may turn him over to the Romans. Mithridates' death is as bizarre as the rest of his life. After sending several messages to Pharnaces asking for safe passage, all of which go unanswered, he realizes he will either starve in his palace, fall victim to the mob, or, worst of all, be handed over to the Romans for their amusement. He takes out the poison he always carries and mixes it, probably with wine, although the ancient historians don't say. And before he drinks it, Mithridates gives some to his two daughters who are trapped with him, so they don't fall into the hands of his enemies and get subjected to the kind of thing women are often subjected to in that situation. The girls fall asleep and die almost immediately, but 
When Mithridates takes the rest of the poison himself, nothing happens. He tries walking around a bit to speed his heart rate and get the poison flowing through his body, but it still has no effect. Realizing that the poison won't kill him, Mithridates goes to one of his bodyguards, a Gallic soldier named Batuidus, and asks the man to kill him. And Appian has him give this little speech that's worth quoting because while Mithridates almost certainly doesn't say this in his final moments, it's as if Appian can't help but put a little moral lesson into his story. He quotes Mithridates as saying to Bituitus, quote, I have profited much from your right arm against my enemies. I shall profit from it most of all if you will kill me and save from the danger of being led in a Roman triumph one who has been an autocrat so many years and the ruler of so great a kingdom, but who is now unable to die by poison because, like a fool, he has fortified himself against the poison of others. Although I have kept watch and ward against all the poisons that one takes with his food, I have not provided against that domestic poison, always the most dangerous to kings. The treachery of army, children, and friends. End quote. Batuidus grants his king's final wish and runs Mithridates through with his sword. So dies the last independent king of Pontus, and the last man to threaten Roman hegemony in the east for more than 300 years. He dies in a tower, surrounded by enemies, just like Rome's last mortal enemy, Hannibal. At least, this is the story put out by everyone who was in the tower with him. A body is sent to Pompey as proof of Mithridates' death, but it was never properly embalmed, so the face is unrecognizable after a journey at sea. It could be any old body, and Mithridates could be alive and well somewhere. Pompey nonetheless announces that the corpse is that of Mithridates, hosts a funeral in his honor, and buries him although the sources can't agree on where, so like his hero Alexander the Great, there is no tomb of Mithridates for future generations to visit. Assuming he's actually dead, Mithridates leaves behind him a number of other mysteries. The first is the nature of his death itself. Was his daily dose of antidote really sufficient to make him immune to a deadly dose of poison? It could be, and the irony is enough to have kept the story alive in people's minds for millennia. But, just as likely, Mithridates would have died had he taken the entire dose of poison. By splitting it three ways, it may have been enough to kill both of his small daughters, but not enough to kill a full-grown man who's been taking a daily antidote. Another mystery is the mantle of Alexander the Great, a relic of the ancient conqueror which is found amongst Mithridates' possessions after his death. Where did he obtain it? And why did he never show it off, since he wanted to emulate Alexander so badly? Along the same lines, where did he keep his gold? Mithridates was fabulously wealthy, and was known to stash gold all over the place. But nobody knows whether he used it all up, or whether there are several hidden caches still stashed away in distant caves or buried under the ruins of long-collapsed buildings that are now archaeological sites. Maybe one of these days a Turkish or Ukrainian treasure hunter will come across a chest full of Mithridatic gold. A conversation about Mithridates' belongings wouldn't be complete without mentioning the Antikythera mechanism. This ancient mechanism was discovered by divers in the early 20th century, 
and a 2008 analysis revealed it to be a mechanical computer that can calculate the positions of the stars and times of eclipses and other astronomical data. In fact, the Antikythera mechanism is the world's first known computer of any kind. It's incredibly complex. The manufacturing is exquisitely precise and whoever owned it must have been fabulously wealthy. Here's the kicker. Strabo writes that when Mithridates fled Sinope for the first time and Lucullus's troops moved in, they looted the city. But Lucullus himself took two items of inestimable value from Mithridates' treasury. One was an already ancient sculpture of Sinope's mythical founder and the other was an astronomical device that Strabo doesn't describe, but simply refers to as the Globe of Belarus. This globe was apparently put on a ship along with the other valuables and sent back to Rome, but there is no further historical record of it. And as it turns out, the shipwreck where the Antikythera mechanism was found was a Roman galley that sunk sometime between 70 and 60 BC while carrying treasure from the Third Mithridatic War back to Rome. Are the globe of Belarus and the Antikythera mechanism one and the same? It's impossible to say for sure, but it sure looks like they could be. These are just a few of the unanswered questions surrounding Mithridates, but it's fitting that such a mythic figure should leave us with a few unsolved mysteries. And whatever else he is, Mithridates is the consummate mythic hero. In The Poison King, Adrian Mayer cites a composite hero script developed from the early 20th century works of Otto Rank and Lord Fitzroy Raglan, each of whom created a list of traits common to mythical heroes across different cultures and time periods. In total, Adrian Mayer's composite script consists of 23 items, which can be treated as a checklist. The more items a hero checks off, the closer they are to the prototypical mythic hero. These are things like father was a king, mother was a princess, and bizarre circumstances surrounding birth. The comet of 135 BC certainly qualifies on that count. As for marries a princess, the daughter of his rival or predecessor, Mithridates scores twice on that count. Not only is his sister Laodice his mother's daughter and therefore the daughter of his rival, but she's also his father's daughter and therefore the daughter of his predecessor. There's a lot to dig into here, and you can find the complete list of heroic traits in Appendix 1 of Adrian Mayer's book. On this hero scale, Mithridates scores a perfect 23. Cyrus the Great and Oedipus are runners-up at 22 points. Romulus, the founder of Rome, scores 18. Alexander the Great, Mithridates' idol, scores a lowly 7 points. And if anyone's curious, Harry Potter gets a score of 8, edging out Alexander the Great as well as John F. Kennedy, who only scores a 5. Jokes aside, Mithridates' hero score is higher than all the rest, and while a single mythotype checklist is hardly conclusive, it's tough to find another real historical figure who hews so closely to a literary version of the ideal hero. Following Mithridates' death, Rome will face no serious opposition in the Eastern Mediterranean or even the Black Sea for over 300 years. In the immediate aftermath, though, there's a lot of cleaning up to do. Much of this work falls to Pompey, who installs administrators throughout Anatolia and the Levant and brings that entire part of the Mediterranean into the Roman fold. Even before Mithridates' death, 
Pompey is already down in Judea, conquering not just the Jewish homeland, but what's left of the old Seleucid Empire. Of the old Mediterranean kingdoms, only Egypt remains independent, and only nominally so. Within another generation, Egypt too will become a part of Rome. With the end of Egypt's Ptolemaic dynasty will come the end of the last vestige of Alexander the Great's once world-spanning Greco-Persian Empire. What's left of Mithridates' empire won't even last that long. Mithridates' son Pharnaces is installed as king of Pontus, but functions as little more than a Roman puppet. This changes during Caesar's civil war in the early 40s BC. With Pompey and Julius Caesar fighting for supremacy over the terminally ill Roman Republic, Pharnaces conquers Colchis, connecting Pontus and the southern Black Sea with his Bosporan kingdom in the north, then invading Bithynia and defeating a series of Roman legions. His father would be proud. But eventually, Caesar wins the civil war and returns to Anatolia, where he defeats Pharnaces and forces him to leave Pontus for good, although Caesar allows him to return north to the Bosporan kingdom. It's an empty gesture. Like his father before him, Pharnaces has failed to properly manage the Bosporan kingdom, and now the people and the army have risen up against him and they now follow a new king called Asander. Pharnaces tries to fight Asander, but his men are outnumbered, don't have any horses, and they're overrun, with Pharnaces himself being killed in the struggle. Ironically, Julius Caesar will replace him with another son of Mithridates Eupator, also named Mithridates. This new Mithridates will only rule for a few years before Asander deposes him from the throne, and within 20 years, the new Roman emperor, Augustus, recognizes Asander as a very popular and therefore legitimate king, and the Bosporan kingdom remains a client of Rome for almost as long as the empire exists. Later on, Crimea will be part of the Byzantine Empire eventually becoming a center of trade between the Byzantine East and a Nordic people called the Kievan Rus, the ancestors of today's Russians. None of this would have happened if not for Mithridates' early conquest of Crimea, and his actions and those of his successors to pull that part of the world firmly into the Roman sphere of influence, even if they did so unintentionally. Most importantly, the wars between Mithridates and the Roman Republic draw the Republic eastward, deep into old Greek Anatolia. The war with Tigranes draws the Romans further south into the Levant, bringing Judea into their empire and setting the stage for the rise of Christianity as a world religion. From the Roman perspective, this eastward expansion changes the definition of what it means to be a Roman. So much so that during the Roman imperial period, people often don't talk about Roman or Greek culture, but Greco-Roman culture. There's still a lot of rivalry between the Greeks and the Romans, and some of this even continues to this day, but nothing like the kind of rivalry there was before the Mithridatic Wars. A few generations prior, from the Roman perspective, Rome had been the western homeland of civilization, and the Greco-Persian successor states of Alexander the Great's empire had been the exotic east. With Greece now firmly in the western sphere, the line between civilizational clusters is redrawn in the Middle East instead of in the eastern Mediterranean, between a massive Roman Empire and the lands of Persia. The ideas of East and West may be broad generalizations. They may be cultural constructs, but cultural constructs matter. These constructs change everything within a culture, 
from how people on both sides of that invisible east-west line think of themselves, to what languages they speak, to the history they learn in school, to the cultural touchstones their politicians use as shorthand in communications. The struggle between Mithridates and the Roman Republic in many ways defined the geographical bounds of Western culture. And that's why it's relevant. If you've made it this far, thanks for listening to Relevant History. If you want show updates as well as my random thoughts about whatever, you can follow me on the app formerly known as Twitter at at Dan Toller Podcasts. That's at Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. For episode transcripts and other odds and ends, check out my website at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can subscribe on Patreon at the link in the episode description. Membership used to be $5 a month, but has been temporarily lowered to $1 a month. This gets you access to the private Discord server, as well as to all 25 episodes of my video series, Dan's War College. The time to sign up is now, though. At some point soon, I'll be resuming production on the video series, at which point access will go back up to $5 a month, although I'll keep the $1 tier for anyone who just wants access to the Discord. Finally, the absolute best way to support the show doesn't even cost you any money. Just give us a shout out on social media. The more people hear about relevant history from real fans like you, the more the audience will grow. Thanks for listening.